We do have a room available next door. If you'd like to go next door, the extra people, it's got a screen in there and you can view everything that's going on. Right, I make it six o'clock, so we will start this meeting. Uh, welcome members of the public and members. Uh, first of all, emergency evacuation procedure. I'm not expecting any fire alarms, but in the case of any any anything untoward, you've got a fire exit behind you and the fire exit behind me to the right. Item two on the agenda, apologies for absence. Apologies have been received from Councillors Hope and Councillor McKenzie. Councillor Frank will substitute for Councillor Hope. Councillor Dockerer will substitute Councillor Peake. Apologies have been received from Councillors Hope and Mackenzie. Councillor Frank will substitute for Councillor Hope. Councillor Dockra will substitute for Councillor Mackenzie. Thank you. Can everybody hear all right? Yeah, OK. Right, item three, declarations of interest. Do I have any declarations of interest? Uh, yes, Councillor Andrews. Uh, I'm a member of Morton Town Council Chair. Uh, uh, and so I, I will have heard the opinions of I will have heard the opinions of Malton Town councillors on applications which concern them. Um, is it switched on? Can you hear? <coughs> can you hear me, everybody? Uh, you have to be a little bit closer to that, Paul. Okay. Can you hear me now? Um, I've been canvassed, I'm as I'm sure we all have been, on in, in respect of item seven. Um, and also in respect of um, item 12. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Councillor Mason. Uh, thank you, Chair. I've been canvassed um, a lot by both the developer and the residents of a mother bee on item 7. Councillor Thackeray. OK. Um, I am a relative, indeed the brother of an objector to application number 2022-0053-573, land south of Middle Cable Road, Moulton, North Yorkshire. And as a consequence of that, I will leave the room when the item is um, debated, etc. Thank you, yeah. Councillor Thackeray. Uh, Councillor Windrus. Thank you, Chair. Agenda item seven, I've been lobbied. It's personal, non-prejudicial, non Junior, thank you. Thank you. Yes, Councillor Cleary. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Item seven and twelve. I've been lobbied. Personal, non-prejudicial, non-pecuniary. Councillor Frank. Uh, likewise, I've been emailed on uh, item seven. Uh, it's non-prejudicial. Yes, Councillor Docker. Uh, the same item seven. Non-prejudicial. Right. Yes, I'm the same. Item 7 and 12, I've been lobbied, personal, non-pecuniary, non-prejudicial. And finally, <laughs> Caroline. <laughs> right, thank you. Yes, I think that's a full set. Right, minutes of the last meeting on page pages four to eight. Uh, I will move those as an accurate record. Do I have a seconder? Councillor Cleary, thank you. Uh, can I take that as general affirmation other than any abstentions? Yep. And Councillor Docker. Yes, thank you. Uh, right, uh, urgent business. I have no urgent business that I'm aware of. Item six, schedule of items to be determined by the committee. I have uh, had a request for item 12 to be brought forward on the agenda to the first item, and I'm quite happy to do so. So that, uh, yeah, so Councillor Thackeray, yeah. So, 
Item 12 on page 261 of your agendas. Right, this one's Neves. Yeah. <laughs> That's great. If we could just go to the first map, please. Can everybody hear me? Pardon? Have you registered to speak? Yeah, then that will be fine. I think we have some speakers on this item. Yeah, the Neve will give the uh, her officer's report and then you'll get the opportunity to speak. Yeah, just a question. I, I, why has this one been bumped up the uh, agenda when we have a large representation on item seven in the room? Uh, because because I think we have a majority of people in the room are here on the Motherby rather than Malton. Yeah, we've had a request from the monitoring officer who's attending specially for this item and she wants to get away. OK, thank you. Right. OK, thank you, Chair. Um, so as you're aware this application has been returned to planning committee following the initial committee meeting on the 2nd of august and a site visit with the planning committee on the 16th of august given the passage of time i will make a full presentation again so after running through the site description and the proposal together with the photographs and the maps i'll provide an update on the scheme since the publication of the most recent committee report then i'll proceed to review the material planning considerations um, so as we're aware, the site relates to land south of Lindisfarne, which is 63 Middle Cave Road. It's a substantial semi-detached dwelling located to the south side of the road, and it falls within the town development limits. Um, okay, you can't hear me? Okay, I'll try and speak louder. Um, I have just had a bit of a cold, but I'll give it my best. Is that any better? OK, I'll keep going. Um, so if we can have a look at the first map, this gives a broader odor overview of the backland site and the surrounding pattern of development. <clears throat> On this map at this wider scale, I'd like to at this stage note the properties directly to the south and southeast of the site, which are Beach Lodge and Beach Cottage and their access, which is closely located between properties on Middle Cave close to the south. These are recently approved backland developments, one of which was approved on appeal. So if we just go to the second map, please. Oh, sorry, we've just got the one map. Oh, that was the first map. It was just a wider view of the site. Um, so you can see it's located just to the south of Middle Cave Road. And then the second map, which we've had a chance to have a look at, just gives a more sort of close view of what the surrounding pattern of development actually looks like in this location. <clears throat> this shows the long linear gardens of the properties along Middle Cave Road, um, the properties along Maiden Grieve to the east and southeast, and also the access to the proposed application site just highlighted in orange. The rear amenity space associated with Linda's farm is formed via an L-shaped area of land. This includes a squared off area of grass amenity space measuring approximately 25 metres by 28 metres to the south. And it's in this section together with an access strip linking it to the highway to the north between Linda's farm and the adjoining property number 61 Middle Cave Road that forms the precise application site. The square shaped area of land incorporates closely mown grass, some small trees, mature hedge into the eastern and western boundaries and to the south, a close boarded fence. So if I can just start to run through the photographs, please. So the first photograph is a view into the site from the north on Middle Cave Road. And the second photograph shows this again, just from a more kind of squared on front view. The next photograph, shows the access strip of grass there, the lamppost, and a view looking more westerly towards the remainder of Middle Cave Road. And then the next photograph just shows again from a very similar perspective, but this time looking eastwards. Um, so the next photograph, this is actually within the site and it shows the access point. Um, 
the access width according to the revised plans at its narrowest point is 4.066 metres and the boundary treatment will be relocated to reflect the precise land registry information. So it may appear narrower at present. Um, but for those members who were on the site visit, they'll be able to remember the markers that were put up on the neighbouring side, which indicates where the true boundary lies. So the next photograph is just showing the actual house itself. So the window at the left hand side is indicatively where the front door um, would be relocated. And that is, as you're aware, the subject of a unilateral undertaking which we're awaiting from the applicant. And then the main access, which is just on the side of the property, would be blocked up. The next photograph, this shows the rear amenity space directly to the south of Lindisfarne. And it's this area that would continue to provide amenity space for that dwelling. The new driveway will be located behind a 1.8 metre high fence, roughly where the shrubs are in the background of this photograph. The next photograph just shows again a different perspective of this and the width available. Um, then the following photograph shows this again from the patio area of Lindisfarne. So it shows quite a substantial area that would be retained for this property. The next photograph is actually looking down towards the squared off parcel of land where the bungalow will be located in the background. And the next photograph is actually within that parcel itself, taken at the northern point of where that would start. Um, you can see Beach Cottage to the south of this photograph beyond the closed boarded fence and the eastern and western boundaries, as I'd mentioned, the hedging. So the next photograph is a view from kind of looking from the north towards the hedged boundary with 65 Middle Cave Road and also Beach Cottage to the south. The next photograph is again looking at this from a slightly different angle. So this is from the northeastern corner of the site. And the next photograph, this is within the squared off area of land and it's looking towards the western boundary, again showing the hedge of number 65 Middle Cave Road, um, but also the dwelling of Beach Lodge in the background. So the next photograph is looking towards the north and in this you can sort of distantly see the properties actually that front Middle Cave Road itself. And the next photograph we are seeing the properties of 36, 37 and 38 Maiden Grieve to the southeast um, with the landscaping in between. Now the next photograph is taken from within Maiden Grieve itself and you're seeing the properties that I just mentioned 36, 37 and 38 and the cul-de-sac kind of layout of these properties. The next photograph is actually quite an important one I think this is the access that is currently taken to Beach Lodge and Beach Cottage between properties at Middle Cave Close um, and I think you can kind of see the pattern of chalet bungalow styles that are found here and the last photograph is uh, just a wider view of Middle Cave Close for context um, so if we could go back to the second map that would be brilliant Thank you. Um, so as you're aware, this proposal seeks approval for a new L-shaped dwelling with an independent access onto Middle Cave Road. Um, the agent has confirmed that the, perme the paving in the site would be permeable. So what's being proposed is a dormer style bungalow with an eaves height of 2.6 metres and a maximum ridge height of 6.5 metres. It will be completed with render and concrete roof tiles with an attached utility office element to the northeast, which would be completed with a hardy board material. Um, it would incorporate a pitch rift design with two flues as well. Uh, at first floor level, the openings will be limited to three pitched rift dormers and one rift light on the principal northern rift slope, 
four rift lights would be positioned on the southern rift slope and two pitched rift dormers inset on the western rift slope. There would be no openings on the side eastern elevation closest to Maiden Grave. Um, and as detailed within the committee report, notice of this proposed development should have as part of the original application been served by the agent uh, and applicant on all landowners who in this instance are Susan Balshaw and Nicholas Balshaw. It transpired that notice was only served on Nicholas, which wasn't correct. Consequently, the application was made invalid whilst the correct notices were being served on both of the joint owners. Um, we have had updated certificates issued to the local plan and authority and details of the notice that has been served and the requisite period of 21 days has also passed. Um, notice was served on Susan and Nicholas Bolshaw on the 12th of September um, and following the 21 day period, the application has been revalidated and this issue concluded. No objection to the scheme has been received from either of the joint owners who were fully aware. There was no requirement for any re-advertisement. Um, just by way of other updates, we have had some updated plans this week which show minimal amendments to the roof lights and flue position and the lamp post which we just viewed on the photographs actually indicated on the site plan. These are very small scale things and not considered necessary to reconsult on being so minor. They have been printed for members together with a support and statement from the agent. The unilateral undertaking is still being awaited and therefore the recommendation remains the same to delegate authority to officers subject to the submission of the unilateral undertaking. Um, an updated response has been received from Highways this afternoon following review of incoming recent representations and the plan from the agent illustrating the lamppost. This has also been printed for members, but confirms the Highway Authority remain satisfied with the proposal, but they have recommended another element to a condition to secure the movement of that lamppost slightly, just to make sure that there's no conflict with vehicles access and or egress in the site. Um, as you'll have been able to appreciate from the reports, there have been a large number of representations received and they have been identified and summarised within the previous reports and printed for members where appropriate. Um, a response has been received late this afternoon from the Town Council, which has also been printed for members uh, relating to technical um, concerns. A further copy of response has been delivered for this meeting uh, by Moulton Town Council. So this has also been provided to members on their desks. But I would say that this was also indicated on page 343 of the agenda. So you'll hopefully have had time to read and digest that beforehand. Um, I have been requested to give a short overview of the surrounding site history, including that of Beach Cottage and Beach Lodge to identify when and where these were approved. Um, and as you're aware, these are just the two properties, the two chalet bungalows to the south of the application site that you can see on the map. Um, the westernmost of these, which is Beach Lodge, was initially approved via an earlier appeal decision in February 2012, which was prior to the adoption of the current development plan. And this design was subsequently updated via another approved scheme in 2015. This well, and which is now built is a chalet bungalow with a maximum height of 6.25 metres. This was the rear garden to Gil Ross, which is number 67 Middle Cave Road at one stage and includes an access that we were able to see in the photographs between one and two Middle Cave Close, which was approximately three metres wide, according to the officer's report, and about 30 metres long. Um, It was in 2011 that officers at Rydale did uh, recommend it for refusal, um, but the inspector, whenever they approved the scheme, confirmed both reasons for refusal couldn't be upheld and that the area around is typified by fairly low density of residential development, with subdivision allowing both houses to have ample room with relatively limited views from surrounding areas and suitable distances from neighbouring properties. It was also concluded that the development, including the access, wouldn't result in material harm to neighbouring amenity. Um, following that, the easternmost well in which is Beach Cottage was approved via the grant of permission from this council in December 2015. And that was following the adoption of the Rydale plan, local plan strategy. Um, 
That also included a chalet bungalow with a ridge height of 6.7 metres. The officer's report at that time noted the following. The application site is located within the development limits of Malton, the principal town, and a key focus for growth in the local plan strategy. The property proposed, however, is in a backland location, which is not expressly supported by policy SP2. However, by virtue of other decisions within the immediate area and based on the impact upon the form and character of the area, together with the general presumption in the favour of sustainable development contained within policy SP19, it's considered that the development of this plot is considered to be acceptable in principle. These properties are considered to be similar in their positioning, in their form and proportions, um, all currently occupying backland locations. So just moving on to an overview on the principle of development, the previous reasons for refusal. As you're aware, an almost identical scheme to this current application was refused in 2020, as detailed within the planning history. Um, the recommendation for approval has been very carefully considered by officers and it is an on balance recommendation. The previous recommend the previous reason for refusal, which was the first reason for refusal of that previous application, um, noted that it was by virtue of its backland position that it wasn't considered to be an acceptable infill plot within an otherwise built frontage, but it related also to the long narrow access that would result in a form of development that didn't, that wasn't considered to respect local distinctiveness. And this is acknowledged and some concerns do remain in relation to the position and the length of the access. However, and critically, the position afforded by the recently granted certificate of proposed lawfulness also identified within the plan and history acknowledges that an identical driveway in this same location and a garage associated with Linda's Farn in the squared off area would be permitted development. So consequently, irrespective of this application, the rear of this property could at any time be used for garaging with a new access provided in the same location as that currently proposed without the grant of plan of permission under permitted development rights. Therefore, this previously identified impact upon local distinctiveness could be realised at any time. Therefore, this fallback position is given significant weight in the consideration of this revised scheme. Also, concerns have been raised within the incoming representations about land registry parcels and their separation, which are noted. However, this issue was also addressed as part of that lawful development scheme consideration, which is the CLOPID. Advice was sought at that time from King's Chambers and the conclusions were made, which remain relevant at this time. In that officer's report, it was noted Further consideration was given to the points raised within the representations in relation to the separate land registry parcels and whether these impact upon the extent of domestic curtilage associated with Lindisfarne. Whilst historic ownership could be a relevant factor to consider when identifying the extent of curtilage, it is not determinative. As the LPA, following a review with Council, are of the view that the land upon which it is proposed the outbuilding would be built is within the curtilage of Lindisfarne, then it is capable of potentially benefiting from the identified permitted development rights afforded to properties. Also, in terms of the backland nature of the site, members have been able to note the other two identified backland plots located to the south of the site, um, Beach Lodge and Beach Cottage. And we have been able to sort of revisit why those were approved. It's not considered that there's a strong or defensible reason for refusal in principle to prevent further backland development of a similar style and height proportions in this location, given the existing and established pattern of surrounding development. It's considered that a dormer bungalow within this squared off area would visually relate to the existing bungalow developments mentioned together with those present along Middle Cave Close, where physically it would be closely co-located. It's therefore considered that on balance, the first reason for refusal of the 2020 application has been overcome. The second reason for refusal noted concerns about adverse impacts on the amenities of occupiers of adjacent properties by virtue of additional noise and disturbance relating to the use of the access. And there was concern about overlooking of private amenity spaces. Um, It's noted that this proposed dwelling and the new side access would serve one household 
and that's akin to the fallback position that we've noted, which could also provide garage and to serve one family if it were undertaken. The level of journeys and usage wouldn't be dissimilar. It's therefore not concern, considered that this would relate to materially harmful additional impacts upon the occupier of, I, of 61 Middle Cave Road to the east of the proposed new access drive. It's also noted that the occupiers of this dwelling have not objected. Furthermore, it's considered the use of this access would likely be at very low speeds coming in off a 20 mile per hour area of road. So it's appreciated that in this theoretical fallback position, the occupiers of number 63 would be afforded control of the access if it were to be used to access their own garage. Whereas if the scheme was approved, they wouldn't and the land would be subdivided. So we have carefully considered the amenity of future occupiers of a separate 63 Middle Cave Road. Uh, the agent has provided plans of the internal ground floor space of the dwelling, which would potentially be most affected by new vehicle movements. This included limited openings, a door that would become a window to a hallway, a small window serving a non-habitable room and a secondary window to a living room. The opening nearest the proposed new access in the front elevation would become the new entrance. Um, and it's that that forms part of the unilateral undertaking that we're seeking to get just to ensure that that would occur and that change would be made before a second property was inhabited. Um, there is also a closed boarded fence proposed to the side of Linda's farm to make sure that there's amenity space secured within their rear garden area. Um, therefore, it's considered that the second reason for refusal where it relates to impacts of the proposed access is also considered to have been overcome. The remainder of the second reason for refusal relating to privacy has also been addressed as detailed in the officer's report within the amenity section and changes were made to the plan to secure that. Um, consequently, it is considered that the previous reasons for refusal have been addressed to the point where a recommendation of approval is off is given by officers. Um, in terms of character form and landscape, and the proposed dwelling, as noted, would incorporate a dormer bungalow style, and it's considered that the form, scale, materials and design as outlined in the report are acceptable in this location and would relate well to the existing surrounding development, um, particularly beach cottage and beach lodge, which are dormer bungalows incorporating similar height proportions. It's not considered that this would have any harmful impact upon the character of the wider locality or relate to harmful street scene impacts. It is acknowledged that the host dwelling is an attractive traditional building, but the distance of the proposed dwelling from this and the existing surrounding development allows officers to consider this likely to assimilate without material harm. Conditions are re recommended relating to material samples, details of hard surface and landscaping, uh, protection for existing landscaping and additionally a lighting condition. In terms of amenity, the range of consultation responses are noted and are acknowledged and have been carefully reviewed. It's considered that the existing boundary treatments at the site would ensure no loss of privacy would be experienced as a result of the proposed ground floor level openings. However, the position of the first floor level openings and their relationships with neighbouring dwellings have been carefully considered as was detailed. It's considered that subject to conditions to prevent any further first floor level openings, the remaining openings wouldn't relate to a material impact upon privacy due to distance and positioning. Furthermore, whilst the garden of Lindisfarne and uh, would be subdivided and reduced, it remains the view of officers that there would be sufficient amenity spaces for both properties. Um, then moving on to access and highway safety, North Yorkshire highways have consistently confirmed no objection to the proposed development subject to a range of conditions. Um, this was reconfirmed as of today with an updated response printed for members. Um, there is uh, an additional requirement to be secured within a condition that would secure the movement of the lamp post. Um, this has been provided to the agent. There's no objection to this received. So this updated condition would be attached to any approval. Um, so it has been very carefully considered and it's also considered that the necessary two parking spaces for each property can be achieved. In terms of other matters, there have been some concerns raised in relation to the accuracy of the plans. 
The agent confirmed that the drawing has been based on an OS map purchase from ProMap, but they further noted in response yesterday that the use of OS maps are acceptable and the topographic survey is not required as part of the application validation or decision notices. Measurements relating to the separation distances to the site of number 63 have been measured on site by Fusion 13. As can be found on the Rydale online planning system, schemes are decided without the use of topographical survey. It's common for plans such as these to be based in OS software. Therefore, although concerns have been raised about the precise accuracy of distances, um, this has been responded to. And in practical terms, given the distances involved, it's not considered that there will be material impacts experienced. In terms of drainage, there is a very full and comprehensive drainage condition recommended. But additionally, the landowner has confirmed that the water and electricity supplies to Beach Cottage do go over the land, but they take a route closer to the hedge of 65 Middle Cave Road. Apparently, they insisted on that whenever it was installed and supervised the digging of the trench. However, the full drainage condition will still be recommended and this information will be secured at that point. Therefore, to conclude, it remains the view of officers that the proposed dormer bungalow development can be accommodated within this backland location. It is acknowledged that this is a similar scheme to that refused under the 2020 application. However, the proposed access being achievable under permitted development rights weighs in favour of the application. The persons most likely to be affected are the occupiers or future occupiers of 63 Middle Cave Road and the proposed changes to the internal arrangements of that property, including the relocation of the front door, which would be secured by the submission of the unilateral undertaking, would be sufficient. So whilst it does relate to backland development, given the prevailing character of the surrounding dwellings, it's not considered that this would be unacceptable or materially harmful, particularly following careful consideration as there are no harmful amenity impacts identified. It's also considered that this would be acceptable in terms of access and highway safety subject to condition. Um, it is also considered that the proposal has been appropriately made and the correct relevant certificate submitted and that the accuracy of the drawings has been verified by the agent. Therefore, on balance, officers recommend this proposal is approved subject to the range of conditions and the receipt of a signed unilateral undertaking. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Neve. Do members have any questions for the officers? Yes, Councillor Andrews. Yeah, two two questions, um, Neve. First of all, the, the two um, uh, approvals that you've um, mentioned um, they were given um, before the decision um, was made on the twentieth um, on, on 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 application twenty zero zero three eight six. That's correct, isn't it? So therefore, there was no. Um, as far as those two decisions are concerned, there's no um, change in the, in the planning history apart from the um, access, which I'm coming on to. Um, yes, that's correct. So, as I'd noted, the westernmost of the two backland developments to the South Beach Lodge was approved in 2012, and there was an updated scheme in 2015 to amend details. Uh, the other one, which is Beach Cottage, was approved in 2015, December 2015. Thank you, Neve. Um, now the next question um, relates to this um, uh, uh, to this garage. Um, w would you confirm that the purpose, that the intention of the applicant when he made that application, uh, was to remove the, the garage at the front of the house and put it at the back? Because that's what we were told at the site meeting. I seem to recall. I don't think there was a site meeting for that. Oh, sorry, the recent site meeting. Yeah, I mean, the purpose of the CLOPUD is to determine what is permitted development. No, Sydney, the question is, that's what we were told by the applicant, was it not? I can't, honestly, I can't quite remember that particular detail. But what I would say is that the CLOPUD was submitted as the applicant was seeking confirmation on what would have been permitted development. They got the confirmation that it was permitted development to build that garage at the back. But as part of that permitted development rights, there would be no ability for us to insist on the garage at the front being removed. 
Um, it would be at the will of the applicant if they opted to build a garage at the back, whatever they decided to do with the one at the front. But it wouldn't be a matter that the planning authority could get involved in. Okay. okay. Any more questions? Yes, Councillor Goodrick. Thanks, Chair. Um, I, I, I should declare that I am also Chairman of North Yorkshire Building Control Partnership. Um, and I've uh, looked at this um, quite extensively with regard to the length of the driveway from the roadway to the proposed property. And I'm, I'm not entirely sure I know what the full length of that driveway is. Um, but I do have some concerns and I appreciate they are probably building regulation concerns which are regarding the access for a fire uh, unit to get into that building. Um, but certainly I sat through um, four hours of building control um, lecture um, with regard to the Grenfell uh, report and it is now part of building control legislation or it will be very shortly that we reduce the distances that firemen have to travel between a building that's on fire and the fire tender. So I have some really concerns about the length of this driveway. And I noticed that uh, Simon Nicholl from North Yorkshire Building Control does make reference that fire can be controlled in other ways other than a fire tender. But it does, it does give me some concern, does this uh, bit of the application. Thanks, Chair. I, I just wondered what the full distance was, actually, because I think the maximum amount that they want a fire officer to travel after he's been in the building back to the fire tender with breeding ap apparatus is no more than 30 metres. Thank you. Um, yep, the access strip spans 62 metres approximately length from Middle Cove Road to the squared off area that I'd mentioned. Um, and I have had responses. I did contact Building Control. Um, I have had the response from Simon Nicholl. And as you said, he did indicate there's other ways that that could be controlled. Um, and it is something that if it precluded the development at building control stage. I think that would be the separate sort of legislation. We do sometimes get people coming back to address things where it wasn't possible at building control stage, but I don't think it's been ruled out by building control officers at this point. Thank you. Thanks, Chair. All right, thank you. Are we all done for questions? Yes, I see no more. Right, we have two speakers on this item. The first being Councillor Ian Conlon from Malton Town Council. If you could come forward and can you speak quite closely into the microphone, please? Yeah, that's fine. So that people next next door can hear as well. And you will have three minutes and I'll give you an audible warning. That working now? Uh, yes, thank you. That's fine. Yeah, I'll give you an audible warning when you've got 30 seconds left. Uh, thank you. Um, I just to take a couple of comments were made um, uh, before I go into my speech. Um, it is not acceptable as far as Malton Town Council is concerned. Um, and also your um, your 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 mo your um, mention that one of the uh, neighbours did not object. Um, that does not mean they've approved it. Um, I happen to know that it is an extremely elderly gentleman. Right. Um, the correct procedure, firstly, um, the question is whether the correct procedures have been uh, followed. And uh, I did circulate th at this um, later this afternoon about that. Uh, that's a matter for um, councillors to check with officers uh, that the correct procedures have been done. So secondly, um, this has already been refused. And those original um, reasons have not changed. Um, and to use a certificate of lawfulness is a sham. The, the certificate of lawfulness does not affect the original um, reasons. OK, the original arguments still stand. OK, coming back to some of those reasons, the inadequacy of access. The use of access to the property. Is a massive intrusion 
up and down behind people's houses, particularly 61, I might say, but it also to number 65. Um, the idea that a garage is a, a, anything equivalent to a property, a garage of the existing property um, compared to a brand new property. Um, I would imagine the uh, the use of it is far greater and far more intrusive to 61, 63 and 65. And the massive thing is the precedent. OK, um, there are long guns all the way along there. So. Um, there were wider issues as well. The effect on the street scene. The historic value. Edwardian. The sheer tightness. Of of the um, of the access should be a real concern for all. OK, so really um, I would be recommending you refuse this. Based on those issues, you have all received um, that comments, so. I think that's it. Thank you. All right, thank you. <clears throat> thank you, Councillor Conlon. Our second speaker is the objector, objector Ashley Lyne on behalf of Mr and Mrs Laurie Thackeray. I think you know the routine, three minutes and I'll give you a warning at 30 seconds left. Thank you. Good evening, members. I'm here tonight to raise objections to the proposed development in a professional capacity. During the planning process, Stone and Associates Architects have raised a number of procedural and material issues in relation to the proposed development. Is that better? Hello? OK, we can go. Um, in our letter dated the 26th of August, we raised concerns in relation to the thickness of fencing and existing hedges and their effect on the proposed access driveway. The plans are insufficient in relation to their accuracy. The reference to the additional space on drawing A904001 F does not physically exist and therefore is irrelevant and should be omitted. The officer report also notes that whilst an agreement has been made, I think that just switched off. Hello? In addition to this, Hello? Hello. Right. Uh, can we just carry on from where I got to? Yeah. yeah. OK. Um, in addition to this, no attempt to resolve the sighting of the lamp post has been brought forwards. This post will project circa one metre into the proposed access way. I appreciate that recent uh, uh, consultation has been uh, received. Um, it is noted that the agent has confirmed that the mapping information is licensed. However, the license number only pertains to its copyright. This does not confirm the accuracy of this information as per our dated letter and should not be utilised in this format. A full measured survey should have been carried out to determine the site limits. If approved, the usage of this format of information will set a dangerous precedent for future applications in Rydale. It is noted that a section of landscaping is to be installed along the driveway. However, how can a suitable screening be installed in under half a metre of space? Furthermore, the issue of parking to number 63 has not been resolved. Highways will only comment within the red line boundary. The LPA have the ability to comment on applications outside of the red line boundary, and this has not been confirmed or approved. 
A further uh, photo was submitted during our letter. It should also be okay, confirmed that Moulton Town Council have indeed refused this scheme. It is our professional opinion that a number of planning policies have not been adhered to fully. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lyon. Right. Yeah. I'll uh, allow Neve to come back on some of those points. Thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, there's a, a few points really. Um, in relation to the accuracy of the survey, we have been advised by the um, agent that it is accurate. Yesterday, he provided a written letter which has been given to members on the desk. It's just a wait and scan in at this moment in time. And it's as I read out before, um, measurements relating to the separation distance to the side of number 63 have been measured on site by Fusion 13. So from their perspective, they are content that the achievable distances can be achieved. Um, that is sufficient from our perspective. Uh, if for any reason it transpired that the adequate width couldn't be achieved, that ca could have an impact upon the scheme as a whole. Um, but at this point in time, because they have been out onto the site and done those measurements, um, they are they are satisfied. Also, members will remember that the true boundary is apparently not where the hedge is. It is where the posts that were visible during the site visit are. And that is uh, really into the land registry data. So from our perspective, we have checked numerous times, but they have indicated that the 4.0066 metres is available. Um, I know there is an indication about landscaping. I think that can still be achieved, but there is a landscaping condition. So if that couldn't be achieved, that could be dealt with at that time and maybe further landscaping installed elsewhere on the site. Um, the issue about the lamppost has been addressed that will be secured uh, to be moved by planning condition. Um, then in terms of the Clopud, that was submitted um, and we had to assess it as we do any application and it transpired that what was proposed under that Clopud would form permitted development. So. I don't agree that we haven't indicated why the previous reasons for refusal have been overcome because I think I have done that in my presentation and in the various reports that have come to members. The fallback position is now um, kind of markedly different uh, in this instance and it's for that reason why we have recommended an on balance approval for this application. I think I've covered everything there. There was a lot of information in the two. I think that's it. Thank you, Chair. Right. Thank you, Neve. Right. We'll open it up for debate and Councillor Andrews, it's your ward. So would you like to kick off? Yeah, yes, Chair. Uh, I think the important thing that members need to bear into account is that this is an on balance um, recommendation. Um, this is not one where we're being told that we have to uh, that we have to approve it. Or have to refuse, or have to refuse it, as as as, as, as it, otherwise it might be. Um, my what what I see before me is two reasons for refusal, um, and they're set out in page two seven seven. The proposed development, by virtue of its backland position located to the rear of the existing dwellings, is considered not to be an acceptable infill plot within an otherwise built-up frontage. The plot is proposed to be accessed by a long, narrow access and would result in a form of development that does not adequately respect local distinctiveness. Um, the proposal is therefore considered to be contrary to policies SP2 and SP16 of the Develop Rydell Local Plan Strategy. Secondly, the proposed dwelling development would not give would give rise to a significant adverse impacts on the amenities of the occupiers of the adjacent properties by virtue of the additional noise and disturbance associated with the use of the long, narrow access way. The proposal would also rec result in, a re in an additional overlooking of the private community areas of adjacent dwellings with an associated loss of privacy. The proposal is therefore contrary to policies SB16 and SB20. SB now, I, I can't see 
and I'm t we're told that the application that before us is exactly the same or almost exactly the same um, as the one as, as the one that was refused um, in in 2020. But we're told that there's there are two there are a number of uh, things which have happened since then. Well, first of all, so, uh, things that have not happened since then is regard the the grant of two planning applications for two bungalows in area in in places if you're close to this site. Um, these applica these applications which were granted are confirmed to have been granted before um, the refusal of the 2020 application and therefore must have been taken into account by council and officers um, before uh, that refusal was issued. And so therefore I see no reason on the basis of those two properties which have been given, refu given refusal to say uh, that we should change our mind because that's what we're being asked to do. The second issue relates to the um, uh, access, for a access for a garage. Well, I'm, I'm quite honestly, I'm surprised they even had to ask for a certificate of lawfulness for this because it sort of go, seems to me it was something that would go to it, go with any house. Um, but um, any, in any event, I recall going to that sort of site meeting and being told that the reason for that application uh, was because the applicant at that time or his predecessor was thinking of moving the garage, which is roughly untidily stuck out of the front of the house, um, to the back of the house. Um, which, to my mind, um, has nothing to do with the building of a new house, of a, of a new bungalow miles away down the garden. So again, on balance, I don't think um, the situation has changed. Um, I've I've attended Morton Town Council and, and and I did not vote on this one. I listened uh, to, I listened to the arguments. Uh, which seem to me to be perfectly reasonable arguments. Uh, and in the circumstances, Chair, I move refusal. Thank you, Councillor Andrews. Anybody else wish to speak? Yes, Councillor Goodrick. Thanks, Chairman. Um, I'm, I am struggling with this one, um, and, and I know that the officers will tell me that building regulations is, uh, is not a planning material planning consideration. However, sorry, sorry. However, um, curb to curb, the minimum requirement for a fire engine, which is a fire pump, is 3.7 metres, and the drawings only give 3.6 metres. Um, and I don't know whether there's enough turning space to get a fire engine out without it having to reverse. So for me, there are some real safety issues with this. Whilst I appreciate building control will say there are other measures to do this. The most notable way to get a fire scene to is to send for the fire brigade and an engine. So I'm struggling with this one. Thanks, Chair. Anybody else wishing to speak on this? Yes, Councillor Cleary. Like everybody, I'm struggling with this, and it is, as has been pointed out by, by virtually everybody, a balanced decision or a balanced recommendation. Um, but I think, in my own way, I think the, the a, a case for for refusal has to outweigh the case for approval, and I can't quite see that just yet. Um, it is, you know, a difficult one and a balanced one. Um, you know, looking at the the, the narrowness of or the, the width of the of the access, um, I, I appreciate that uh, a fire tender is a larger larger vehicle, but actually eight foot uh, overall is quite a reasonable distance, uh, quite a reasonable width for standard uh, access, and it's not every time that you you know you're going to need the larger vehicles. But I do appreciate the building control element of of, of people's concerns, but we're dealing with planning here. Right, anybody else? Right, well, I'll speak. No, I'm sorry, it's it's only members who are entitled. Thank you. Uh, right, well, I'll have a go from the chair. First of all, I'd like to thank Neve for negotiating yet another difficult and contentious application so diligently. Uh, it's clearly been a, a very long, protracted one. 
I have to refer to page 281 of the agenda regarding the two very similar and immediately adjacent backland developments with Beach Lodge approved on appeal, which really set a clear precedent, and then Beach Cottage approved based on that precedent. And given that this proposal complies with our local plan policy, that the access road is of acceptable width, albeit it's on the tight side and there are some clear difficulties. And the other issues have been fairly dealt with through conditions. And I'm struggling to understand the level of opposition to this one. And if refused, I can't help but feel that decision would almost certainly be overturned on appeal and could well be shown to be unreasonable. So I've yet to see any really compelling reasons for refusal and therefore I won't. So I will move approval. But at the moment I have one for refusal and one for approval. So if anybody would care to second one or the other, we can go to a vote. Mr Chairman, I will second uh, your move for approval. Thank you, Councillor Cleary. Would anybody else wish to speak? No, in that case, we'll go for the vote and the vote is for approval. And I have to add that it's subject to the signing of unilateral unilateral agreement which would be delegated to the officers. Right, I have, I have six votes for, one vote against and one abstention, so that is carried. Right, if Councillor Thacker is listening in the other room, could he pop back in please? Right, we now move to back to I, agenda item seven on page 12. And this is one being done by Jill. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, this application, this the, or the site of this application uh, is one of our allocated housing sites. Um, so the principle of using the site for housing and growing the village in this location uh, and within the extent of this site is is established by by the development plan. Unusually, I think for an allocated site, it's proposed to be de developed for affordable housing, 100% affordable housing, uh, which is a combination of affordable tenures and sizes, uh, and they're documented in the report. A small kiss and drop facility is also proposed as part of the scheme, which will be transferred to a Motherby primary school to own and manage. The report makes it clear that there are a range of objections to the proposal, although consistent concerns relate to uh, the 100% affordable tenure, the scale uh, of the development in terms of the, the numbers proposed, but also I think in terms of the, 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 the footprint of the developed or the proposed to be developed area, um, traffic and design. All of the issues are outlined in the report, although I'd like to draw members' attention to the late pages as one matter in, in relation to minerals and waste safeguarding was omitted in error from the report. Uh, you'll note from the update report that the developers confirmed that mineral extraction from the site prior to the implementation of the scheme would not be a, a viable proposition for them. 
The report update provides a list of draft conditions. Uh, they are in draft form and they do uh, need further proofreading and clarification. Um, it is also considered that it would be beneficial to include a further condition to require the submission of a management plan for the kiss and drop facility prior to the, the, the facility coming into, into use. Although details of, of, of that, the details of, of the management arrangements, we would look to secure as part of the Section 106 agreement and the legal transfer of the land to the school. Um, just by way of a further update, we've received two further late objections, which I will read. They are relatively short. Um, I think most of the issues raised uh, are, are included in the report, but I, I will read them out. Um, they're both from um, uh, uh, local residents. So the first is, um, in its present state, I do not believe that uh, it best serves the parish or residents. Um, provision whereas the provision of affordable housing is a laudable aim in this age of inclusion and diversity it is sad that this is seen fit to build monoculture housing which will fail to enrich the lives of its residents a development of mixed housing would be much more appropriate to the area with options that allow residents in time to own their own homes therefore contributing to their sense of well-being and belonging and allowing older residents to downsize within their communities releasing family properties for those whose future circumstances may afford them the opportunity to move on the proposal in its present form is much more suitable to an urban setting whereas in, where amenities exist to accommodate such an influx of people the assimilation of new residents will also be hampered by the physical barriers effectively isolating the development for the rest of the site from the rest of the village. In conclusion, I consider the proposed development to be the total antithesis to the needs of the village and its environment. It's too large and contradicts many aspects of the Rydale plan. It needs a radical rethink to ensure that a Motherby and Rydale remain a place that people want to visit and raise their families, that communities can feel supported and listened to, and that the quality of life that's so important to the Rydale plan can be retained. In recent years, Rydale has risen in the nation's conscious, consciousness. Food festivals, multiple television series, low COVID rates and its natural beauty. In a post-pandemic, post-COP26, surely it would, could further enhance its reputation with well thought out sympathetic development rather than lazy ill considered one size fits no one housing estate which is totally at odds with its environment and people it's disappointing that more thought hasn't gone into creating growing sustainable communities and that developments such as the one proposed will only strengthen opposition to further developments across the region the second um, uh, representation that's been received is as follows if homes are needed, is this the right place for such a development? Question. Uh, point one, if you're a low income family slash single parent family and are housed here, how do you access services? If you do not drive slash cannot afford a car, then how do you get to the shops, surgery and see friends, etc.? 58 houses are far too many compared to the size of the existing village. No other place in Rydale is having such drastic change made to their areas. Can a development be entirely social slash rented housing? Question mark. The drainage will be a problem as all the rain rainwater soak away area, area will be lost and run off will reach the school. Um, uh, the proposed storage tank slash soak away is to be maintained by who? Access from the kiss and drop is dangerous with children having to walk through parked cars. Proposed car parking is insufficient and in the wrong place. Car, cars cannot be safely pulling in and out of car parking spaces so close to where children are being dropped off and walking. More, many more car parking spaces for the school are needed. The school is already very full, so it will need money uh, and planning to increase its facilities, more staff, including more staff car parking. The nursery and out of school club is at full capacity, so it will need money um, to increase its facilities. Why is the field on the edge of the village being used when there is a, a, a uh, brownfield site, um, the old garage uh, in the village. I think, Chairman, it's probably safe to say that the, many of the, uh, the concerns raised in those late objections reflect other objections which have been received. Um, I think just in response to the capacity of the day nursery, uh, I'd add that the County Council, as the Education Authority, has not identified any issues with early years provision or capacity, uh, which they would seek contributions to improve. 
Um, parents do have a choice over the location and type of early years childcare and any lack of capacity at the Meadowfield nursery would not prevent childcare being sourced elsewhere. Um, if you could just have a look at um, some of the photos, there are quite a few photographs um, which I'll try and run through um, yeah. as, as quickly as I can. Um, if you really just watch your eyes. Thanks. So that's um, the aerial uh, view of a um, satellite image of the site, um, which is located to um, uh, the the west of of a mother bee uh, and to the north of the bee 1257. Um, so it's the the application area is for all intents and purposes um, the the allocated site, um, uh, which members members will be familiar with. We can just move on to the next slide. So this is just stand. So this is a photograph taken from the main road, um, just looking at the um, uh, Motherby Crossroads, which I think members will be familiar with, uh, looking in an easterly direction. So um, the access to the site um, is is probably just a little, just to the 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 right there of that second car. That's broadly the access point to the site, and the site is behind the hedge in that location. And just move on to the next slide, please. Um, this is just a, 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 a close up taken from um, very close to the access site. You might just be able to notice. Uh, oh, I've lost my uh, uh, a red mark on the floor there that just uh, delineate, delineates the, the boundary of the site. There's just another slight red mark on the on the pavement there, which is um, the, uh, the 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 extent of the um, the the access, uh, the, the the bell mouth um, access of the junction onto the B1257. Move on to the next slide. And this is just taken from um, the other direction, looking in the westerly direction <laughs> and the, the red the red mark that you can see on the on the floor there is the other side of the uh, the, the the bell mouth of, of the junction um, that will be created into the site. So we just moved on to the next slide. So this um, picture is taken um, from the public right of way that runs in a west easterly direction across the site. So I'm standing there in the sort of southwestern corner of the site, looking across in a sort of a north easterly direction, um, and you can see quite clearly there the um, the 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 line of the public right of way across the site, so it joins um, the, the 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 current built up part of the village, uh, at just to the sort of the south of Cherry Tree Walk, I think it is, um, and then runs down a little sort of snicket into down to Main Street. You just see, um, you might just be able to make out members some stakes uh, on the grass there that certainly that members that, that that came to the site visit would be familiar with, and they just uh, delineate delineate the sort of the extent of the of the the front elevations of the the first line of of housing on the site. Um, so just broadly, um, because I think this is probably um, a. a it, 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 it's a shot that shows the site in, in its sort of most panoramic shot of the site. Um, you might just be able to see in the distance the school. So that northern boundary of the site runs across there. Um, running parallel with the northern boundary of the site will be some open space and the kiss and drop facility. Uh, the western boundary of the site will be um, landscaped with additional tree planting, uh, hedging and native shrub planting. Um, the bulk of the development, so there's a, it forms forms into sort of four main blocks, will be centrally located in the site. And then there'll be areas of open space along the eastern boundary and along the uh, southern boundary. So we can just move on to uh, the next slide. So that's just looking um, from where I was standing before, but looking almost directly east along the southern boundary of the site. There's the boundary hedge. Uh, the access into the site will be in that far sort of south eastern corner. Again, you can just mark, you see some of the stakes that are marked out there. 
um, as being the extent of the front elevations. Move on to the next slide. Um, this is just um, this is taken from walking from the village main street uh, up the public right of way towards the site. So that's the snicket that that I was talking about. Just move on to the, the next slide and that's at the end of that snicket onto the application site. So if you get your bearings there. So to, to the right of the picture there will be the houses that um, back onto the site that currently are at um, Cherry Tree Walk, I believe the, the, the small estate's called. Um, and in terms of the development layout, um, immediately in front of this shot here would be um, some bungalows and their gardens and then behind them uh, towards the northern elevation would be the kiss and drop facility. Uh, so that kiss and drop facility obviously is accessed by by car through the main estate road, uh, but there will be a, a pedestrian access into the school um, from from that facility. In this part of the proposed scheme, um, the, there is the intention that to provide a, a cycle and footpath only route through to Meadowfield. Uh, there's currently a, 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 an agricultural track that runs uh, from Meadowfield into the site and it's proposed that that will form um, a, a route into a, another route into the village. That's just another um, shot taken from the end of the public right of way looking across um, the the northern boundary of the site in a sort of north easterly, northwesterly direction. Move on to the next shot. And again, that's just panning round, starting to look further south. You get, an, a, a, I think, an, an indication from, from that shot of, of the, the land levels and how it slopes. I think that the slope um, across the site, it drops by about 14 metres. Thanks. And and that's just another shot looking almost directly in a, in a sort of a direct south um, direction. So at the minute, the public right of way runs from that um, that corner of the site diagonally across to where I'm standing, where I've taken that shot. Um, the intention is that the public right of way would be diverted, permanently diverted to run along um, the um, the pedestrian route along the southern boundary of the site and then down through the open space uh, that will be created on the eastern side of the site to connect back into uh, the, the this point here uh, and down through that snicket back to, to Main Street. Move on to the next slide. Yeah, that's just another one again looking directly south. So the um, the 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 main body of open space on the eastern side of the site will be here. Um, there is a tree there which although not um, referred to in the tree survey as being removed, it is on the plans as being down to be removed, uh, which is not something that, that our tree officer has, has has objections to. It's not that big tree, it's this this one here, it's this smaller lime tree I believe it is. Move on to the next. So this shot is taken from Meadowfield, looking up what is an agricultural track towards the uh, towards the site. So that will become the sort of pedestrian and cycle route only uh, down through to Meadowfield. Um, you can just see the backs of some of the properties of Cherry Tree Walk um, on the, uh, the the left hand side. We'll just move on to the next slide. So this is a shot that's taken from another public right of way that runs um, at the back of at the back of the school uh, across towards Appleton the street. So that's looking um, in a easterly direction. So so that's the site there. That's the school building there. Uh, again, you get an indication of the uh, the fall on the on on the site. I think what's also quite apparent there is just how important um, additional landscaping um, will be required for that western boundary. Um, it is a boundary obviously with with trees and some hedgerows, but the hedges are quite scrappy in parts. Um, so I think that, that, that there is a need for for the, to be some a comprehensive planting scheme on that western side, which is something which is required through through our policy and 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 the allocation. Just move on to the next site. 
Uh, slide. Thank you. That's again taken from the public right of way that's looking back towards the school. Uh, you just get an indication of some of the buildings, some of the other buildings in the Motherby uh, poking above some of the, uh, the the landscaping there. And the next slide, and that's again taken from the footpath looking um, through um, through a, a very small gap in the hedge looking at the site. You see some, um, this area is a school playing fields and then the site is just located beyond that. So quite sort of obscure views from, from, from that vantage point. Move on to the next slide. So the next um, series of photos um, are, are, are designed to, to illustrate a few things to members. Um, one is some of the, the, the sort of the built features of a mother bee. Um, uh, that's, and I think it's referred to in the design and access statement that because of the slope within the village, you do see quite a few retaining walls and boundary hedges or fencing. Um, so that will be a feature of, of the site. It's not the intention that the site will be levelled and built on. Uh, the developers will work with the slope. So it does mean that it will be retaining walls and fences um, incorporated as part of the scheme. So some of the other photos that we'll move on to are just designed to um, show some of the variation in some of the built form and, and, and design of houses in a mother bee. They were taken also at a time. I mean, those members that visited the site, um, that did the, the site visit, we I think we undertook the site visit to coincide with the school drop off time in the morning, the morning drop off. So the photos I'm going to show you and not just to show you the uh, for you to take in the sort of the built form of a mother bee, the built character, but also it shows you the car parking in the village at around the time that the school school pick up time in the afternoon. So that's from about half past two that I was at the village till about half past three. So we'll just go through um, the, 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 the photos. So this was um, this is just taken from uh, the main the main road um, and it just shows some of the existing residential development that's um, uh, on the edge of of the village and the various styles of so some traditional development, some um, fairly early mid 20th century development. If we can um, move on to the next slide. So this is lo just looking down um, Main Street. Um, I, I, You'd have to forgive me. I, I know some of the street is Main Street and some is High Street. I'm not sure the point at which it changes, but um, that's taken at about uh, 20 to 3 in the afternoon. So at that point, it was already quite parked up with, um, as I understand it, parents getting ready to pick up children. So that's quite um, quite far in advance, I think, of, of the school um, uh, children coming out of the school. I have to say that most of the car parking took place on that side of the road and I didn't see at that point in time anybody blocking driveways or or anything like that. We move on to the, the next slide. This is just a, again a similar sort of time between sort of 20 uh, between sort of half past two and 22 um, 20 to three. Uh, that's just car parking on Meadowfield with the school in 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 the distance there. We move on to the next slide. This again is a cherry tree walk. So again, some some a, a small modern um, estate um, on the edge of the village and and car parking that was there between, I'd say, quarter to three and three o'clock at, at that time. If we just move on to the next slide. <laughs> And that's just further uh, to the north of the village, the northern end of the village. Um, again, at a similar time between sort of quarter to three and three o'clock. Uh, again, some various house styles. Uh, that again is at the, um, the 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 northern end of the village. I think that's the Seven Wells um, housing, small housing site, which was uh, it was either built in the, in the late 1980s or early 1990s. But again relatively modern in, in its style. If we um, move on to the next slide. Um, so again, another shot from um, the other end of the village looking back up Main Street um, before the school, um, before the school, um, the children left school. Um, and just move on to the next slide. 
Uh, this is when it's starting to get just sort of past three o'clock and the uh, the minibus turns up at the same time as a food delivery van. Uh, again, it's most of that side of the street is parked up with um, with cars. I, I believe most of it was was related to school traffic. Just move on to the, the next slide again. Similar sort of time looking back down the street and onto the next slide. So this is at a point when the children were starting to leave uh, the, the, the school. Um, and this is, I think, the point where it starts to get more, um, it, it starts to get busier uh, on, on the road because cars are starting to move around. So this, the all of these um, the next shots are taken from about um, 20 past three till about half past half past three, quarter to four. So you can just see that as cars start to move, um, the, 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 the pressure point comes when traffic is, 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 um, is held back at the junction. Uh, and particularly if, 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 if lorries or cars are coming the other way. What tends to happen pretty quickly is the parked vehicles on the street move um, move rel relatively quickly. You just move through the next few slides. So this is just images looking up and down the street of the point at which it starts to get really busy as traffic moves, um, as school traffic leaves. Just the next slide. I think there are a couple of photos that, that you know, the point at which lorries um, and, and cars do, you know, do meet um, at that at that junction. Let me just continue through. So, so it's busy. It is busy when the school is 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 moving. It, 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 the children are, are, are moving uh, as they leave school. But gradually it does start to thin out. As I say, the, the parked cars move and as the traffic uh, gets out of the junction onto the main road, it starts to flow. And within between 10 and 15 minutes, it, it it clears. So so that's the sort of the last of the tailback. If we, that that and the next slide. The last of the tailback and we'll continue through. So within 15 minutes, it's pretty clear looking down the street and up to the junction. So it is a, a peak time when the children are are leaving the school. I just thought that certainly for those members that attended the site visit to see what the the traffic was like in in the morning, it would be useful to show you some shots of um, of what it's like in 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 the afternoon. Chairman, I think the fact that the site is allocated for housing and uh, the type of housing proposed is much needed in Rydale and North Yorkshire weighs, weighs heavily in favour of the proposal. Uh, we need our allocated housing sites to deliver housing. That's the purpose of, of them being allocated. That's the purpose of the designation. The proposed kiss and drop facility is a benefit of the proposal. It has been included to ensure that as part of the development of this part of the village, it can help to address problems experienced at the village with school related traffic. It's not a facility or a location which is designed to remove all of the school traffic from the village. It's designed to help uh, address a problem to, 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 uh, to, to divert a proportion of the school traffic which is currently experienced. The scale of the development proposed balances the need to deliver much needed housing and an efficient use of land with the need to provide acceptable standards of residential amenity, open space and landscaping. I think it's probably fair to say that in this respect, uh, the scheme or certainly the built footprint of the scheme is probably around uh, the maximum in terms of, of, of the area or the numbers that can be achieved on the site whilst providing necessary open space, drainage attenuation, noise mitigation and landscaping. But in officer's view, as proposed, it doesn't compromise to an unacceptable extent the amenity or necessary landscaping. Appropriate landscaping and lighting scheme will be conditioned to mitigate the visual impact of the development within the wider landscape. And 
there are no technical matters, including highway design, noise mitigation or drainage that can't be overcome in developing the site. Chairman, all of the issues are considered in the report and the update report, and the recommendation is one of conditional approval. That would be subject to revised plans. Uh, that's to address some minor emissions from the landscape master plan, uh, changes to the materials plan to include some additional uh, use of stone and the incorporation of chimneys on some plots which have been raised in, in, in representations to the scheme and to ensure that there is consistency between all of the plans to be conditioned. Um, it would also be subject to a section 106 agreement and that would to cover the affordable housing occupancy and eligibility and the transfer and management details of the kiss and drop. Um, if members are minded to approve the application subject to the to, to, to those matters, um, I would ask if authority could be delegated to me to agree the planned revisions and to finalise and refine conditions. Thank you. Right, thank you, Jill. Do I have any questions? Yes, Councillor Mason. Um, <clears throat> In the late papers, you gave us um, an indication that the term affordable designation has now been dropped. Can you explain that a bit more as in how does it affect the tenure? There was some discussion around, it's all around the description of the development. The, yeah. the, the affordable designation hasn't been dropped. The, the, the proposal is for affordable housing. Um, uh, that is the, the, the scheme. Um, there was some discussion about whether the words affordable housing needed to be in the description of the development. Um, the, the, the 10 years will all be conditioned as part of the plan. I think the applicant was concerned about including affordable housing in the description of the development, and that's purely from a sort of a practical point of view. Homes England funding will be required as part of the scheme. And it's unlikely, or I'm led to believe that Homes England won't agree to that if the description is for affordable housing. And the reason for that is, although the tenures proposed are affordable housing, the shared ownership and the affordable rent, in the longer term shared ownership, people can staircase through shared ownership and can and can and can purchase them outright, at which point they 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 are potential that they're no longer affordable housing. So the description it wouldn't match effectively the description, but the plans, the tenure plan would be conditioned. So it's quite clear that as the scheme is that's been proposed is for affordable housing. So it's not being dropped in that respect. It's just we can't include it in the description because there's an issue then with the Homes England funding. So this is just to access the grant funding to build the houses. That's then. my understanding. OK, sounds. Um... Interesting. Um, does that mean then in that case then that these houses, if they're not affordable, um, and you just said that um, some of the tenures people will be able to buy them, the, some of these houses will be able to make it available to local residents to buy. Um, the, one of the biggest contentious issues on this is, on this seems to be that uh, there's no way that local residents can buy them without qualifying for affordable housing criteria. That's a concern of one of the residents. So. I just want to clarify exactly how these houses are going to be sold or rented um, because now they're not affordable, even though they are affordable, even though they are just affordable. to get the money to build the houses, which makes it sound like they haven't got the money to build the houses. No, I think the for the shared ownership funding, my understanding is that the developer, we can't have a description that refers to affordable housing if if because because of that affordable housing in time, the shared ownership products could become somebody could 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 own them entirely. And, yeah. the, and, and, and there's problems with that. The shared ownership is a, a product that anyone in uh, that can't afford to buy in the market, including residents, local residents, um, that anyone can can apply to actually um, uh, occupy. Um, providing they meet criteria that are established by Homes England so that you'd have to be an affordable housing need. You wouldn't be able to afford to buy a property on the open market. Um, 
but but it, it, they're not offered as open market dwellings in the first instance. There would have to be a combination of 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 rent and um, and ownership. That that's my understanding of the model shared ownership. Okay. You couldn't buy it outright from the beginning. But you but. Yeah, well, since I am able to, when would that be able to happen? For instance, well, it, it, I think that because depends I, I do on notice already that and other other North Yorkshire sites that Yorkshire Housing have, you can already buy the houses outright straight off the peg, as far as I understand, in Selby and Sherburn. So it, again, for local residents here, there's a want a willingness to want to buy locally for their families and everything else, and they don't seem to have that option unless they meet the criteria. The other question I would have on just on the affordable section is, have we judged this whole application based on the fact that we want affordable housing, but now they're asking us not to criteria them as affordable. I find this quite an interesting conversation because, you know, they're, we're saying these are affordable, they're saying they're affordable, but oh, don't tell Homes England because we won't get the money. That just seems no, uh, no, Homes England, crazy. Homes England know they're affordable housing. They wouldn't be funding them if it wasn't. It's it's a, they are 10 years that, um, that, that, that are acceptable uh, 10 years to, to Homes England. Um, I think it, this, it's the description of the development we're talking about. It's not the what is being proposed. What is being proposed will be conditioned and it will be secured. Certainly, uh, the 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 where we can um, where we can secure eligibility specifically for local residents will be secured in in the section one hundred six. No, no, no. It's all all of the products on this site are affordable. Right. Housing. But if a local occupancy needs clause is kicked in on this, then does that mean the criteria can be used for local residents or do they still have to meet the affordable housing criteria? Twenty of the units will there'll be there will be um will be affordable products that have specific occupancy criteria that are related to that, that we use for, 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 for securing affordable housing on any site. Yeah. So in other words, prioritize uh, local residents of a mother be surrounding parishes and a to Rydale. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, the rest of the affordable units on the site, um, the affordable rented products will will be um, to let through uh, North Yorkshire Home Choice, uh, and the shared ownership products will be available to. Um, I think it's probably anybody that 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 qualifies for 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 shared ownership housing okay. so that can include residents of Rydale it can include residents of the village but it can include residents from further afield okay just just want to so to clarify then they would have to meet that affordable criteria as a local resident of the mother to get one of these houses they cannot just move into this new I noticed in the report it says there's other properties they could buy if they want to. But be that's in affordable housing need can apply for any of these houses. You have to be in affordable housing what need. we can do as a as as a planning authority is we can secure 20 of them for definite. They will be uh, local residents, um, and, and and that's it. Um, local residents and residents of Rydale, the usual cascade. But that doesn't prevent anybody else from a mother bee or further afield in Rydale, surrounding parishes, to 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 go on to North Yorkshire Home Choice and put their names down for one of those affordable rented products, or to uh, contact Yorkshire Housing and and seek to um, to 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 have one of the shared ownership properties. It doesn't doesn't exclude local people. Apart, sorry, you were going to say something. Apart, apart from, from needing to meet the criteria to meet, to we well, have to be in affordable housing need to get an affordable exactly. home. That, that that's what I mean. I think that yeah. is one of the contentious problems in the village are having is this is cutting a lot of the village out if they want to, and they are in a different catchment. Mm. You know, it's it it's what it's the app it's the application that's in front of us. Yeah, yeah. Right. Okay, Councillor Thackeray. Uh, yes, thank you. Just picking up on what uh, what you said. Um, I would like to know if these houses are for affordable rent and mm -hmm. the part rent, part buy, yeah? Mm -hmm. Part ownership, in other words. Um, and you said that the owner, tenant, occupier, mm -hmm. will have the right to purchase them outright. At what point in time does that um permission 
kick in? Yeah. Does it kick in for the person that comes along with hundred thousand pounds and says I can buy half of it and the other the other bit, but actually then I would like to um, buy the whole thing six months down the line and then sell it on another thirty percent profit I think, or turn it into an Airbnb. I think that um, that in terms of the the ten year split, it's it's sixty percent affordable rent, forty percent shared ownership products. So thirty five of the of the homes would be affordable rent and 23 would be um, shared ownership. Um, the shared ownership, in terms of staircasing, um, I think it depends on the individual and it depends on what they can afford. Um, and I don't know the details of the of the of the chunks between and the uh, between rent and um, and proportion of ownership. But I suspect it's something which Yorkshire Housing offer. Uh, you know, there's a spectrum that's offered to people and the how fast and the extent to which they increase the, 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 the amount that they own will depend on the individual. It will depend on the household and that household income. Um, I think in terms of um, the, my understanding is that for a lot of shared ownership products, yes, you can staircase to full home ownership. Um, I think in Rydale, um, under, and I think it's under housing legislation, that would need um, the, the, the consent of, of, of our um, housing services manager to be able to do. And I think that's specifically um, in relation to um, protection for, for, for housing stock in rural areas. But there is a, it, the extent to which people can, can, can staircase up and purchase more of a proportion of, of a home will, will depend on the, on the individual. And, and their individual circumstances. And it will vary across households. Uh, thank you for all that information, but the actual question that I asked mm. was very, very uh, specific and relates to how long, what length of time, what period of tenure does an individual who manages to access one of these properties mm -hmm. have to remain a tenant and a part owner before they can enter into an agreement to purchase the rest of the property because granny and granddad might be sitting around the corner saying look you get the paperwork sorted out and we'll give you 100 grand I, I at don't which know. point i don't and know well this i think before we can approve anything like this these houses that are supposedly for the benefit of people that can't afford to get on the housing ladder mm. can be gone in six months to clever people with with um, clever clever brains and clever money mm bang disappeared your 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 shared ownership properties are all gone the people that can afford i think them. That, i think that's only I think it's if, a commercial venture by the back door no i think it's only if um if 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 in the circumstances that people have the right to staircase right out and i i, I don't believe that would happen very well, quickly well in, in which case we should be saying to uh we should be having a condition on here that for the first 10 years of the existence of these properties they cannot be sold outright because otherwise you do not protect any housing for local people at all. At all. You're just creating an opportunity for somebody who's very canny to go one step, two step. Thank you very much. I own it. Let's put the margin on the top and get rid. I think it's creating the opportunity for people who aspire to home ownership to be able to do that. Absolutely. To, to be able to we need a condition of 10, 10 years or 15 years. That's my recommendation. I'd like to make a, um, um, a proposal. A, a, a proposal. No, not a proposal. I'd like to amend the, the we condition that these properties are av remain available for shared ownership, shared rent for a given period of time. By all means, negotiate it with the developer. But 10 years seems to me like a sensible um, period of time in which to gain some benefit back from this for the local community who are going to be um, well and truly dropped on by this volume of housing anyway. But we haven't come to that yet, have we? Without knowing what the impact that would be for the developer in terms of funding from Homes England, I, 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 I can't say we would be able to commit to that. All I can say is that um, I think for shared ownership as a product, um, most people um, that aspire to home ownership will 
will be in a shared ownership situation for a very long time. And it's not a situation where people will just parachute uh, 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 in. And I'm, so, I'm sorry, but you're, that, that's a, such a completely woolly um, a, a statement because um, without a condition, you don't know if uh, that person is completely savvy, completely switched on, completely financed, doesn't have to be in their bank account. And they think, whoa, how's this coming up in a mother bee? Let's have 10 of them. How do we go about buying 10 of them and just turning them over? Unless you have a condition that says you have to own them for a period of time, the scheme, the scheme is nonsensical as far as I'm concerned. Right. Thank you, Councillor Thackeray. That's a proposal on the table for a amendment to conditions. Right. Uh, Councillor Andrews. Uh, um, yes, Chair. Um, can, can, the, can the officers confirm? Because I find it quite... I've, I'm looking at page 21 and um, I find it quite difficult to believe, actually. It's the, it says the proposed scale of the proposal results in about a 38% increase in the number of homes in the parish. Now, you're talking about the parish, you're talking about um, the combined parish of um, Mother Bay and Swinton. Is that correct? I got a figure for a Mother Bay. Oh, and, and, you've got, and it's another and there's another thing i'm talking about the second paragraph from the bottom mm -hmm. and yeah and then it says it as far as the mother bee is concerned it would be a 40 7 percent increase in homes almost a 50 percent increase in homes is that correct yes that was a figure that was given i was taken from some of the representations that have been made that's spe specifically a percentage increase of the numbers of properties at at the actual sort of built up area of the village rather than the wider parish so so therefore if there are more people in these houses than there are in the existing houses of um, a mother bee, um, the existing residents could be outnumbered by this development. If there are more people in the new houses, yes, but depends on, I think it depends on, it depends on how many people occupy how existing houses and future houses. Any more questions? Yes, Councillor Goodrick. Just a small question. Um, I'm looking at the 5% allocation for bungalows and it comes out at 2.9 and we've got two. Well, I wondered why we couldn't yeah. get a third one. I know it's I know it's very small, but actually we do need bungalow accommodation for our elderly, elderly <laughs> residents and this seems a missed opp opportunity. Yeah, it's been rounded down to the to, to the figure of two. Um, it's it is what what is in front of us. Um, there isn't a, a, a another um, bungalow on the site. Sorry, there are two bungalows proposed. Um, there isn't there isn't there isn't any more. There should really be three. That's my point. We're rounding down 0.9. We should be rounding up to three, not rounding down to two. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah, it's it, it it's the scheme that's in front of us. Um, I don't know from the developer whether there's the flexibility to swap one of the plots. Um, um, perhaps they, um, they might want to comment when they're uh, making their speech. Um, but at the minute, it's two, <laughs> two, the, it's the two that's that's on part of the scheme. Any more questions? Yes, Councillor Mason. Um, you mentioned the kiss and drop earlier. The kiss and drop management needs to be negotiated. Um, this application has been sold on the potential solution to the traffic issues in a mother bee. Um, uh, with the creation of this small, as you've said, kiss and drop point, uh, uh, the plan is to hand this over to the school, which I'm pretty sure is going to lead to more pressure on a small school already. Uh, I know full well they struggle with traffic management there already. Um, Logic suggests that the kiss and drop, judging by the photos that you've just shown us tonight, will only be used in the mornings, if at all, because of parking, unless we're expecting to shove lots of cars down the middle of this estate from what time did you say it was? Half past two till half past three, I think we was the example used. Yeah. Um, I need to know how this is going to be managed before I can really make any decision on this. I mean, are the school going to queue the kids up outside the school and ask the kids to jump in the cars they're going past? You know, it, it's, you know, and it, it, it's crazy. And also, how is that going to be, a, be able to manage the child safety and safeguarding, for instance, as well, with, you know, approved parents coming through? 
Um, it just it just seems to be a large consideration with this development, and I, I'd like to know how the school's going to be shielded from the complaints on the traffic levels, because I know already the school gets a lot of complaints already existing, and it just seems to me we're going to pile more pressure onto the school here. Um, you know, can we have the plan before we move forward with this application? The, 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 in terms of the broad management of the kiss and drop facility, um, the school and the highway authority have, 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 have just looked at how kiss and drop facilities uh, operate elsewhere. Um, I think it, the, the belief is that it can be managed. Um, the, there are two key elements to, to the management of it. One would be um, the inclusion of bollards so that the space can't be used when the school doesn't need the, um, the, 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 the facility to be operating. And the second would be that there would be a, a marshal on site at pick up and drop off times to, 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 um, to, to ferry the children into what would be the new school access. So just a question, who's providing that marshal? Is it the, the school? school the so school. the school are going to have to pay more money at their school expenditure to provide a marshal for this, this kiss and drop. That, is, that, is that what we're saying here? Even though we've just heard last week, for instance, that schools in the next two years can be massively under pressure from funding and local well, authorities. That's so my understanding that, that, of how it will be. It, but we haven't got the plan yet, have we? We don't have the plan. That's just an assumption of the plan. We, I don't see a plan for this. Well, it's it's it's. The, 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 it's it's how the county council is saying the school will 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 and and the school will say that they they're prepared to manage it. Um, it's it's designed and it's offered to help the school and the village. It's it's not proposed, as I've said, to completely um, uh, relieve the village of all its school related traffic problems. The, the, the development doesn't doesn't really have to do that. Um, that's an existing problem. The development doesn't have to address or relieve something which is an existing problem. It's just designed and it's been proposed and it's been suggested for a very long time that it that it might help. OK, yeah, well, it has been promoted quite heavily in the consultants in the community cons consultation. So um, I'd be interested to have the school actually been consulted on this. I'd like to know because I don't hear they have, but maybe I'm wrong. Well, the 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 developers can clarify, but my understanding is there have been discussions with the school. That's in some of the documentation, and um, and the local high, uh, sorry, not, the local education authority are aware that there've been discussions with the school. Right. Any more questions anywhere else? Uh, I have a, a very minor question I actually asked yesterday about the possibility of traffic calming going down the main route and you said you weren't too sure but I've just been looking at this uh, the plan on page 36 and there are a couple of little squares on the road going down because I'm aware that there's quite a gradient there uh, are you aware if that's traffic calming or perhaps yes I'm I'm seeing a nod from the back of the room <laughs> answers my question um I think there may be some some limited sort of tables not speed bumps but tables um on that main the main access route down to the kiss all right thank you uh yeah councillor Mason uh, this is a weird question I think and I've already read in the report some of the answer but what's the point of having an indicative yield in our local plan if it doesn't meet the criteria of national policy where we're told we need to maximize land more because it just seems a complete conflict it just seems a pointless thing to say we as a council think an indicative yield on the piece of land this size should be 40 units and then we're then told by national policy that that's only uh what's the word a minimum now that I think has been extremely confusing for a lot of people and I think we're at danger of setting a precedent here as we go forward into other village developments as well. So just just to clarify the indicative 40 units is a minimum because we have to maximise that due to national policy and if that's the case I see no, re no reason why that's in our local plan and used in some cases to re reduce the amount of properties. Can you clarify that? 
it, it is just an indicative figure and that's because when we produced the local plan we didn't have a you know we had a, we had a broad some broad master planning work but we didn't have we didn't have a lot of details that would help provide a a, a, a much more sort of definitive figure uh you're right we do have to um we do have to maximise um, and ensure an efficient use of land, but it was just an indicative figure. And the reason why we needed to provide some form of indicative figure in the plan was because the plan had to allocate an amount of land to meet housing requirements. And without any indicative figure, we couldn't demonstrate um, how we were going to do that. Um, so it's why all of the um, the allocations have an indicative figures um, uh, attached to them it is just that in some case i mean it it it, it, it in, in for some sites it, it it might be different it might be that the 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 sites that come forward when we get detailed schemes it could be less than than the indicative figure um but it, you know it, it it is just that it was there because we needed to provide some form of figure to be able to demonstrate that we felt that um we could meet our housing requirements Right, are we all complete on questions, Councillor Thackeray? Yeah. Uh, Councillor Andrews pointed out that this is a 50% increase in the number of houses in Mother Bay. Um, this is a 50% increase in the houses in Mother Bay according to the 2013 Rydell Local Plan. Uh, as a member of the Local Plan Working Party, as several members here and Chairman, um, we are revising or we've submitted or about to submit our recommendations for revisions to the Rider Local Plan to be taken forward by North Yorkshire Council. Should the residents of a mother be, be fearful as a service village that when the new plan for North Yorkshire Council um, is published that um, a mother be will be further submerged under housing or will this be the end of the assault? I would call it on uh, a mother bee, and I would, I would, I would um, warn the people of Slingsby what's coming down the track towards them, and to be, and Hovingham, and Welburn, and be be prepared for the uh, for the absolute destruction of these small villages that is um, apparently legitimately taking place. I would like to know whether this is the end for a mother bee if it happens or whether it's just the beginning. Thank you. In terms of the the North Yorkshire plan, so the plan for North Yorkshire that the new authority will produce, we don't know what the spatial strategy for that plan will be. Um, that will be something which um, will be developed over time. In terms of our own plan review and our role forward, well, I suppose the extent to which any of the um, the settlements within our settlement hierarchy receive any further development, any further land allocations, is a matter for members um, in allocating further land. Um, you know that that is something which um, the local plan working party are considering. It's something which the the council will do. What I would say though, um, and this was. Um, taken account into account when we when we established the current plan and the land allocations within it was some of the decisions whether or not to allocate land at sites were made on the basis of whether there was a supply a, a, a supply whether there had been recent developments uh, at a place so that is something um, that, that can be factored in if for example members decide to uh, grant permission for this site um, I believe you can take that into account if you're looking at further land allocations in at the service villages as part of the plan review. And you may wish to say, well, actually, we feel that a mother bee has had sufficient. So that's within members' gift. Yeah, can we keep it brief now, please? Yes, there's already, already been uh, site allocations or site submissions, I should say, for a mother bee in the last round of requests for sites. Pardon? There have been additional sites uh, I submitted. There have been, yes. yes, there have. Yeah, there have. Um, for how many houses? I'm not too sure exactly, but extending all the way from a mother bay, all the way to Brickyard Farm. Yeah, and and um, looking west, I believe also. So there is a very very strong threat hanging over the people of a mother bay, 
I, I, that I we are going to, oh, the new council is can going to Can we dump come back to this can. application, please? Yes, we can. I don't believe this allocation added to the new ones is likely to decimate this village and many others. There are no new allocations, Councillor Thackeray. There is there's land, there is there is la there's submissions and the submissions have been put forward by landowners. Um, in fact, you know, invited by us as part of the plan making process to 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 put to put to put land forward, but certainly no decisions made about any further development at, at this settlement. Yeah, Councillor Mason, can we keep to this application? Yep, I am, don't worry, don't worry, I am kind of. Um, so you've just said, and I need to get this right, that, that if this one goes through, this could set a precedent for other applications because this yield on this one is nearly 50% more than what the indicative yield is recommended by a local plan. So, so, and I'm just trying to clarify this for, so I didn't we don't set a precedent to other villages by doing this. And th this is my concern, you see, that we're setting a precedent tonight for other developers to go, oh, look, 50% increase on what the indicative yield is. We can do that Ganthorpe. We can do that Hovigan. We can do that Berrythorpe. And that's, that's my worry here. But none of those sites are allocated sites, are they? They they they're yet to get through 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 the plan making. No, no, I'm just they're, yeah, I'm just asking. You know, okay, I'm just generally citing villages in to general. Consider, and it's within this council's gift to consider whether or not it decides to allocate any of the sites that have been put forward as part of the plan review. Right, that's enough of questions. Thank you. Right, we now have three speakers on this uh, item. The first being the on behalf of the parish, Councillor Nigel Ballard. If you press the button at the front and you should see it light up red, you have three minutes and I'll give you a warning with half a minute to go. Thank you. Good evening. During a pre-application Zoom meeting in February 21 between the Parish Council and the applicant, it was stated that the plan then proposed was not open to major change, but would only be tweaked in response to statutory consultations. In response to the pre-application consultation by the applicant, the Parish Council sent a letter in March requesting changes and residents sent 46 objections. Despite a further meeting between the applicant and the Parish Council, no meaningful amendments were made. In response to the application, the Parish Council sent letters in January and September this year to the Rydale District Council, and there have been 50 comments and objections submitted. The whole process from pre-application consultation to recommendation appears to have been driven by a desire to provide a large number of affordable housing units in a wholly unsuitable location, with no notice appearing to have been taken of any of the legi legitimate and material objections of the parish council or residents, proper planning or the character, housing mix and social cohesion of a motherby. The only changes made have been fairly minor ones in response to the concerns of statutory consultees. In common with other villages around here, anyone who lives in a Motherby has to travel to reach work, shops, doctors, senior schools and leisure activities. The bus service is very poor and the cost of a taxi to Moulton is now £9.20 each way. Speed surveys carried out in July for the Parish Council by the County Council showed the B1257 now carries around 5,000 vehicles a day, meaning cycling to Moulton is not a safe or viable option. On the face of it, this appears to be a good scheme to provide affordable village homes, but being all affordable housing means that the village will not benefit from any SIL contribution. We will only gain a play area and a too small kiss and drop for the school. A mother bee is not against housing on this site or against affordable homes. We understand they are needed. We do though question whether this is the right plan in the right place to put so many. The proposed 58 houses is almost 50%. Left. Sorry, the proposed 58 houses is almost 50% greater than the indicative 40 in the local plan. 
and increases the size of the whole village by 48%, the village centre by 70%. And to clarify one of the questions, the parish includes 20 houses well outside the village. The parish council asks that you reject the application as it stands and require the applicant to enter into meaningful dialogue with both the parish council and district council officers on reduction of the number of houses to an acceptable level, redesigning the, the layout to allow retention of the existing footpath route, improving the house design and materials and improving the totally inadequate kiss and drop for the school. Please carefully consider the impact this scheme will have on the residents of Motherby. Thank you. Thank you very much. We now have an ob the objector on behalf of the objectors rather and botting. Whilst we appreciate and accept that there will be development in a mother bee, no consideration has been given to the objections that 58 houses in one development in a village the size of a mother bee is inappropriate. The local plan gave an indication of 40 dwellings for the local community and the proposed number exceeds this by nearly 50%. The planning officer concludes to be in favour of the development as it will, quote, address the imbalance which exists across the district, unquote. But why this all has to be in one development in one village to alleviate the whole district should not just be the burden of a mother be village to undertake. As Yorkshire Housing are the applicant of the site who are not willing to put a mixed tenure of so sorry, social housing and market housing, this suggests that they are the incorrect developers for the site, as the village would benefit from a very mixed tenure, as houses very rarely appear on the market within the village for those wishing to stay either by downsizing, upsizing or becoming first time buyers. There are concerns within the development regarding the requirement for the installation of a tank and pumping station rather than connect to existing drainage directly. When the planning officer states that the risk of fluvial flooding is low, except at the northern end of the site, which currently floods without the additional development. This shows that the development would overload the existing surface drainage system. With the amount of dwellings being proposed, this would then add to the existing flooding within the village, which during heavy downpours and prolonged raining culminates in flooding at the north end of the village, which turns the roads and footpaths into a river and makes walking, cycling and driving very dangerous already. What happens if this pumping station fails? The planning officer takes into account the quote, benefit from a more balanced mix of proposed external walling materials, unquote. If a development of any sort is to be considered, we would appreciate this concern being seriously taken into account. Whilst there are a mixed range of architectural styles within the village, the number of urban style bright red brick houses proposed will not fit in the existing mix. These types of houses are generally used elsewhere in the country and therefore generic and not in line with the local distinctive character of a mother bee. 30 seconds left. The Rydell local plan states that the existing public right of way should be, shall be retained. The proposed development should respect and work around this public right of way rather than move it to a more convenient location for the development to be created. This public right of way has been in existence since at least the 1800s and before, but no one can locate a date, as the school was located on the B1257 and it should be retained for its heritage. It should be noted that despite the officer's comments, the kiss and drop facility will not resolve the traffic situation at school time. At school time in the afternoon, the parents have to park and go and pick their children up from the school. The children are not brought out of school by themselves. We therefore request that the committee refuse this planning application or seek amendments that would satisfy the concerns of the community. Thank you. Thank you. The third speaker is the agent, Mr. Paul Butler. Uh, 
Ready? Evening. Um, I'm going to go through my notes of all the comments as quickly as I can. I've got three minutes, of course, haven't I? But just start with the precedent. The only precedent being set tonight, if this scheme is approved, is the approval of a, a, a allocated housing site for homes on a designated site in the local plan. Um, going on drainage first, the, the tanks will create a betterment because they'll restrict surface water flow from the site to the bottom of the hill. They'll hold it, restrict the release rate. It's been approved by Yorkshire Water, who will then adopt the tanks. They'll adopt it from there. Uh, on bungalows, I can confirm that we will deliver a third bungalow. Um, we can do that under delegated powers, in my opinion. Um, there are raised plateaus within the scheme, which will slow down traffic as you go from the site to the kiss and drop. Um, in terms of the kiss and drop, we've met with the, um, the head teacher, the chair of governors and North Yorkshire County Council's education officers around five times through the pre-app process and beyond. Um, they've been heavily designed and influenced the design of the scheme, the size of the scheme, the safeguarding of the scheme. There's a new uh, second access, pedestrian access to the school now, which means parents can kiss their kids, drop them, and they'll go straight to the back gate. The, the kiss and drop facility is segregated by fencing. It's got a separate footpath. There'll be a bollard that will be controlled by a staff member of the school. That's been agreed with them. And measures can be confirmed through the 106 that Yorkshire Housing will pay for its delivery and um, transfer it over for, for free of charge. It will improve the existing situation. The footpath from the site to Meadowfield will mean all children from the site will walk or cycle to the school. Uh, and the facility itself will improve if it's one car that goes down there around Meadowfield, it will improve it. But the facility will vastly improve it because it will be more than one car. Um, in terms of the affordable housing, um, yes, the there is eligibility criteria, but it's fairly wide. One of which is £80,000 household income. So the, the houses that are available to local people will be available to a lot of people in the lo local area. And it's there to hit those who are rural workers, for example, which is a key a key economy and, and driver of affordable homes in the district. So that they will be available. They will be able to staircase out. It'll be incremental based on how much they earn and how much they can afford. When you purchase the property, you can, you can purchase 25% up to 75%. The key point about the 10 year scenario that you've requested, Homes England won't accept that. The key thing here is though, that they will remain, uh, remain affordable in perpetuity because when those properties are sold, they'll only be able to be sold back to Yorkshire housing. So they'll be recycled as affordable in perpetuity. Um, in terms of the size of the scheme, the, the density is 25 dwellings per hectare, which is low and below national standards. 30 seconds. All of the houses meet or exceed national space standards. So they're bigger than the average size of, of homes that you will approve. The scale and mix, the, the density is driven by the mix. We've got a lot of two and three bed, predominantly semi-detached homes where you'd normally have the same footprint as a four bedroom property. So we can take two and three bedrooms homes away, which you're desperately in need of, and put big four beds on. The numbers will drop, but the footprint will remain the same. And I'll just finish on the, on the eco design measures. This scheme will vastly exceed vastly exceed local and national guidance and current building regulations. So the principle you set tonight is only positive. It will deliver more of the homes of the type you want and the type you need and sets a very high standard for the rest of the district. Thank you. All right, thank you very much, Mr Butler. All right, that takes us on to the debate. So, Councillor Mason, it's in your patch. Thank you, Chair. Um, firstly, I've got to commend the officers actually for the report because I think there's a lot of work got into this. Um, at the last meeting, uh, we were asked to have a preemptive site visit without the full report in front of us. And I think at the time I raised concerns about that and I feel my concerns will be warranted. I could have done with this report in front of me when we were on the site visit, but it is what it is. And I, you know, I noticed the photos actually do reflect the time when I was going to suggest we go and have a site visit, which would have been at school time to have a look at the traffic at the drop off point. Um, as you've heard tonight, there are many questions and, and to be honest, a lot of the objections raised and, and a lot of the information that's come forward tonight has been in my speech already. So I'm not going to really dwell on too much of them again. Um, but as you can see, there's a lot of concerns that need addressing for the community. And as you can see by the attendance, there's a lot of real, real trouble in this application for the village, as far as I'm concerned. At first glance, it's positive. You know, the climate credentials, I have to agree with Paul, that they're good. They are very good. Um, social housing aspects, good. Local needs even, good. But digging in a little bit more, I just have so many, oh, just, just real issues with some of this. Um, I'm going to skip that page because it's already been addressed. A lot of that are based around um, some of the conditions. Um, 
And Motherby, it, it's an interesting village of Motherby because it is it has a lot of commercial properties in it really. It's got BATA, it's got Westler's Food across the top as well. And it 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 is it does remind me of an urban area at rush hour every single morning when the school's on. And th this is a big concern, I think. Um, the fact that Motherby School makes it a service village is the very fact that if Motherby has a school, it leads to those issues. And Motherby and Swins is classed as one service village, which means it's right for development. But I feel here, and Motherby's taking the load, not just for Swinton, but for the entire B1257. Um, it just, the amount of houses that's being put into this village, I, I, I feel is just too much for me. Um, Following the community consultations and online meetings uh, I had with Yorkshire Housing, it, we did warn, the village warned and myself warned that this amount of houses would be seen too much. Originally they went for 65, um, they reduced it by seven, which to me sounds like they're just disregarding the community input in this at all. It just feels like a, tin, a tick box exercise for them to do. Um, Affordable housing is crucial to Rydell. Yeah, it is, and I'm quite conflicted by this because I'd like to know where we're going to get our social housing, affordable housing from, but not in one place for me. I, 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 you know, I think we've uncovered already tonight why they need to maximise this, and that's the the grant funding. I think it seems to me that the reason they need to maximise this is so they can get the money to pay for these to develop this. That that's what it feels like to me. I would say though that that. I, I do know that Yorkshire Housing are selling a house in our village right now because of under occupancy. Because that's right, isn't it? As far as I know, the, the one opposite you. Oh, okay, but it's being sold. Oh, okay, fine. Uh, that kind of contradicts that point then. Um, the latest parish council submission summarises the case perfectly. It's it's a well argued case with material considerations for a potential objection. It highlights a strong feeling that the community is being ignored. And I do feel looking at this room here, this community is being ignored tonight. And I think we have a duty of this council to make sure that this is done properly. Um, I feel a balanced approach should be needed and the local opinion should be given great weight. It's obvious that the residents, they want, you're happy with the development. That's that's the impression I get from all the representation that I've had. And that's it. That's been said tonight as well. Um, it. it See, I'm, I'm really conflicted on one point here. With that in mind, I, I was inclined to possibly seek a deferral on this, so we, as a committee, can ask the the um, the developer to go back and have a proper consultation with the mother bee to to look at this development properly, and actually look at the 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 amount of housing that's going to be dropped onto this village. But as as I've been listening to this debate, I, I'm more leaning towards backing what the parish council is asking for and moving to a rejection i'm not doing that yet and i'm just hasten to add but that is my gut feeling at the moment that this is what we need to do and and, and we, there is material consideration why we shouldn't i don't want us to do that i'd like us to find a solution to this so my first point of call would be to try and move for deferral so we can ask and write to the um, developers a committee to ask them to take in some of the representations of the community more in and redesign this development and I'm not sure if we can do that or not but you know you know I know full well a mother bee they will welcome new residents with open arms they really will and no matter what happens but I'm sure it'd be a lot easier for them to do so if it was done from a perception of fairness to the village so I'm gonna yeah okay I'm gonna move for deferral Am I allowed to move to Farrell and ask us to write to the developer and ask them to reconsider some of the, the, the yield on this? I think it's an issue that's been raised with the developer. So it's, it's an issue that the developer is mindful of. Um, I think I, I'm not sure that deferring it is going to lead to a different position. Um, the application is the application that's in front of you, and the and and, and my understanding is that in that case, then I will, I will move. In that, in that case, then I will move for rejection mm -hmm. based on what the parish council have said in their submission. So, sorry, what does that mean? There's plenty of other places. Okay, right. Let's not have a shout. Okay, I've got my council clearing. 
I was I was going to support. Uh, I put my hand up when Councillor Mason was uh, moving or potentially moving for deferral. I was going to support him on that. Okay, well so, let, let's stick to that point for now. Then. Uh, well, I, I will let you reconsider your proposal, and I'll come back. Thank you. Well, I'll move for deferral then. That we as a committee should write and raising the concerns, the serious concerns we have about the size of this um, this development on a village of a mother bee. Right, that is a proposal, Council Cleary. Thank you, Mr Chairman. Yeah, I, will, I will support deferral uh, on the basis that uh, Council Mason has asked. Also, just to clarify, some of the questions that have been asked but haven't been answered, uh, and I think um, it, will, it will enable us to come to a better conclusion following a deferral uh, with potentially more uh, consultation as requested from the uh, from from uh, from a motherby residents but also uh, in terms of information for the committee right thank you anybody else wishing to speak on this councillor goodrick councillor andrews yeah um yeah um, chair uh, yes um uh just just one point for clarification and that was um the the house in the house in great hampton uh tenanted house has been tenanted for nearly 100 years i should well it's, it's been yes it must be tenanted for nearly 100 years um it's been there were there was interest from two um families uh in great hampton no yorkshire Yorkshire, yorkshire housing decided to sell it and they not only sold it but they put it up for auction in in, a, in an auction house in london um, and it was sold on the 19th. So that was, that's just a matter of clarification. Um, it's, it's something which is um, which, which really riles our village, um, which, is, which is, of course, just along, just along the road from the Motherby. Um, as regards flooding, I can confirm um, the flooding. Um, I, when it, um, whenever I go to Morton, I have to drive through a Motherby. And when I drive through a motherly, uh, when, it's been, when it's been raining hard, um, the main street is, abs is, is absolutely a wash, and um, it is as though a river is, 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 is going through it. Um, I'm on the application itself, Chair. I, uh, I, I, this is an allocated site, um, so you can't object to um, houses being built on that allocated site. It's also, um, I'm, I'm sure it will be good for the village for new blood to come into the village. Um, but what, but what really concerns me is the scale of the development. And I would hope that when, the, that assuming this application is going to be deferred, that the the scale of this development will be addressed. Um, because I have I have here the Rydale local plan. Quite a total quantity of um, houses. Um, which are um, required uh, in the service villages, 300. Number of service villages, 10. Um, uh, so that's 30 houses per service village if it was done uh, uh, ex ex exactly equal. It says, uh, it, it says here, a pattern and distribution of the allocations. And it says limited small scale sites in or adjacent to current development limits sites to be distributed as far as possible amongst all villages in the category. Now, as far as I'm concerned, um, this is not a small site. It is not small scale. Um, it is adjacent to current development limits um, and it's. Um, uh, I don't think it co co comes within the definition of, be, of being distributed as far as possible amongst all villages in the category. I also I also look, Chair, at the photograph, or not fit, the the imagined picture on page 111. And uh, and what I, and what I do, I mean, you probably members probably don't appreciate what the what the village looks like because you don't you don't see it every day as I do. Um, but as you as you go down. Um, uh, uh, down to the bottom of the hill and enter the village. On the left, on the left-hand side, um, there are an, a nice group of very well-proportioned and, and, and nicely built uh, houses. They look like they're part of the village. Um, the picture on page page, page hundred and eleven looks completely different, completely out of character. 
and I think all the I think I think all these issues I think all these issues should be should be addressed. Um, if if Steve had proposed um, uh, a proposed re refusal, I would have backed him. Because quite not because I don't think there should be a development there, because it, there is a site there. It has been allocated. We can't do anything about that. Um, but th th this kind of development at this scale, to my mind, um, is completely um, out of question. Out of the question. This authority, th this authority, uh, will be breaking its own local plan, and it will be it will be it will be get bending over backwards uh, simply to comply with government a government grant criteria. Which, as far as I'm concerned, is completely wrong. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Goodrick. Thank you, Chairman. It's a tricky one because there is no doubt affordable homes are much needed in the area. With no one's no one's arguing with that. But some members of this committee have been determined to resist further development in Moulton, Norton, Pickering and Kirby Moorside. And the net result is it pushes it out into the villages. We can't have everything. The result of this drive is that this development is pushed out and it is a concern. The numbers are a concern to me because it skews the population of the village so much. And for me, it's about balance and I'm not sure we've got it quite right. So I am going to listen to what the rest of my colleagues say before I make a decision. But be under no illusion, if we don't have houses built in the service villages and the main primary locations, then all villages are looking at significant increases in the housing because where are we going to put them? And that's because they're being driven away from Moulton, Norton, Pickering, Kirby Moorside because the feeling is they've all had enough development. Right, thank you. Councillor Thackeray. Uh, I'd just like to uh, comment on what Councillor Goodrick said there. I think as a working party member, we know that there are sites for at least 700 other houses in the small villages all the way across Rydale so that everywhere can be rejuvenated and, and revitalised with a few houses. And I would say what I've said before many, many times, the artificial construct of service villages is an absolute nonsense. And it's a, it's, it's a mathematical equation that has overdeveloped Moulton and Norton and is on the brink of ruining some of the major villages in Rydale. However, moving on, um, I believe someone used two words, two words that I consider close to swear words, and that's Yorkshire water. <laughs> Who was that person, please? Was, who, who mentioned Yorkshire Water? Somebody did. Oh, hi. Right. OK. Um, just for the benefit of those that don't know, um, the sewage from Bartonley Street is pumped to Appletonley Street, is pumped to a Motherby, is pumped to Swinton, and pumped to Broughton, and then pumped over the hill to the sewage treatment works on York Road Industrial Estate from where I am told reliably by my friends, the undercover agents who work for Yorkshire Water that quite a lot of it actually goes into the River Derwent. Yeah. But um, according to the Rivers Trust, figures published um, in 2021, the Swinton storm overflow Apologies to all those people whose sewage didn't arrive at its correct destination from all the villages upstream. Um, raw sewage spilled 22 times into the tributary feeding the River Rye. So to suggest that any, uh, any permissions are granted by Yorkshire Water is like saying, here is the rope, you do what you like with it. Um, because we all know that Yorkshire Water is um, one of the organisations in this uh, county that um, does not fulfil its statutory obligations. Uh, thank you. That's it. Yes, Yorkshire Water. We can all cheer. We're all safe. Thank you, Councillor Thackeray. Uh, got any more comments down the side? No? Right. Well, I'll say my bit. Well, this is very much a balanced one, and I'm not convinced either way, but what I tend to do is look at the negatives and look at the positives. I'll start with the negatives. 58 dwellings, specifically for people of limited means. 
So I ask myself, how will those people unable to afford a car to travel to work and shops and without a minimum of a safe cycle route into Moulton, what do they do? Need to provide a safe cycle route to a Motherby school to reduce the twice daily chaos of the school run time. Now, during our site visit, the school traffic congestion was appalling. And it's obviously happening on a daily basis. And I'm, it's no wonder that parents insist on driving the children to school due to the traffic dangers. Although it's rather ironic that those dangers are almost all created by themselves. So we need safe, active travel routes to school and we need buses. But of course, there's little or no funding for either or government impetus to do so. Why must the infrastructure always lag behind the development? Next, a significant increase in the village size, around 47% in one fell swoop. That is not organic growth by any stretch of the imagination. However, the development sites in the local plan and it's compliant with policy and so on. Next, a near 50% increase on the indicative yield of the site. That is just plain excessive. It's un it's the usual unimaginative identikit design. Right, those are the negatives. There are actually two extremely strong positives. Desperate need for social and affordable housing in the district. No, not just the district, the whole country. And that is an overwhelmingly, overwhelmingly positive weighting. Next is the sustainable energy efficient, well insulated houses no gas connections. It's surprisingly way ahead of vast swathes of market houses from national house builders and also most commercial developments. Why? The claims are for a 94% reduction in energy demand. If that's proven to be the reality, just imagine the impact on our energy security, our energy demand and our energy cost. If every development was built this way, what a difference that would make. That said, how many of the residents here will be able to afford an e-bike, never mind an e-car? So, to my mind, this is a very delicate balance. I don't think we've got the right measure of this yet, and I fully support a deferral to see if we can improve because I think it's it's just way over the top, and that is the definite feeling among the committee. So, I believe everybody's had the say. The, the uh, proposal is for deferral. We'll go to the vote. Did everybody get that? We're voting again. That is unanimous. Right, thank you. With a mere two and a half hours and two items down, I hope we can uh, get speeding up. We will move on to item eight on page 128. By all means, if the members of the public wish to leave, I'm sure they're uh, more than ready to do so. Jack, can I ask a question? Do we have to give reasons for deferral? Do we have to give a reason for, de for that? Do we have to give reasons? I think so we've given sufficient reason for deferral. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, we will have a five minute recession for a comfort break.
Right, can we start moving back into position now, please? If anybody needs prodding just through the door. Yes, my apologies to the members of the public. We're, apparently, there's a queue for the ladies. <laughs> Just when you were getting quite excited by what was going on. <laughs> it's not always this quite this protracted. Can I advise you have a word with your, um, your staff champion about that? It'd be worth having a word for the staff champion anyway. Right, we're all back in attendance. We'll crack on with item eight. So I think this is you, Jill. Thank you, Chairman. Um, there are no updates to uh, to this application. Um, members may recall uh, this site. Um, it was uh, it was it wasn't so long ago that uh, you determined a, a, an application for changes uh, to a proposed extension uh, at the site. Uh, this is an application for um, the erection of a of a of a garage. Um, at uh, the property uh, replacement garage. Um, when it was originally submitted, we did, did receive <clears throat> objections from, from the residents of neighbouring properties um, on Middle Cave Road. Um, you'll understand the relationship when I when I show the photographs. Um, those objections related to loss of no light and um, an overbearing impact uh, on the amenity areas of adjacent properties. Um, the the officer has uh, negotiated a number of revisions to the scheme, which includes um, the deletion of a, of a proportion of the proposed building, a, a bin and storage area, 
the relocation of the garage um, away from the property boundary and the boundary with the um, the, the, the boundary that's closest to the neighbouring residents and um, a, a reduction in the floor level of, of the building, which helps to lower its height. Um, if we could just um, have a look at the photos, and I'm sure members um, will um, will remember the site. So this is number 20, the mount. It's within the conservation area um, in, in Malton. Um, so you can just see behind the fencing, there are the properties um, that are on uh, Middle Cave Road that sort of they have amenity spaces that sort of back on really to, to very close to the to, to the back of of this property and I think you might just be able to see just to the right hand side the the top of an existing garage uh, that's that's on this site. Move on to the next slide picture, please. So that's the existing garage on the site that will come down. Um, uh, Members may recall that this is the the um, the the existing dwelling portion at the back where um, we've recently approved um, a further extension in this location. Um, so this is the, the 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 garage that's to be taken down and and replaced. Just move on to um, the next one. It's just another image of of the garage on site. And this is just taken from the neighbouring amenity space, looking up at um, the um, existing sort of gable of of the garage that will come down. So um, the, the the replacement garage will be moved further away from from this boundary. It's slightly uh, higher in its roof pitch, uh, but it will be moved um, further into the site. I think that might be the last picture on this one. Yeah. Uh, Chairman, the uh, officers are of the view that the removal of the existing garage won't impact on the conservation area. The proposed garage is proportionate in scale to uh, the host dwelling and surrounding dwellings, that the materials, stone and slate, are acceptable, uh, and that the location and the design preserves, preserves the character of the conservation area. Uh, I think that the changes, in particular the removal of the section of the proposed new building, which is the bin um, and cycle store, um, will will ensure that um, the that there won't be any sort of additional material overbearing or overshadowing impacts on 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 neighbours. Um, so the the um, the recommendation is one of approval subject to conditions. Uh, you'll see that these include the removal of PD rights for enclosures uh, along the boundary, the eastern boundary, and the extension to the garage. And that's to just help with um, the the impact on the amenity areas of those neighbouring properties um, and effectively the cumulative impact that, that, that could happen if PD rights were uh, exercised in addition to the extensions and the new buildings. Uh, so yeah, they're recommended to help control the cumulative impact on neighbours um, of what's planned and what could happen at the site. Um, to that end, Chair, I think we would recommend perhaps um, a further um, condition, which would be the removal of PD rights for further incidental outbuildings at the site, um, just as a, a sort of a belt and braces. Uh, otherwise, Chairman, um, it's uh, the, the recommendation is as outlined. Thank you, Jill. Questions? Yeah, Councillor Mills. Didn't we do that last time in the last application on here? But we no. were going to do it on this no, one. No, we were we? waiting right. for this one, which is why this application's come back to, to you. OK, and is, is the reason this has come back is, is because of um, objections. Well, there were initial objections. Yeah. Um, the, there has been a reconsultation on the revised scheme. And as I understand it, we haven't had anything back that um, that either confirms that those objections are removed or that the objections still stand. The reason why we've brought it back was just because I think we'd said at, in, 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 at the last me. meeting that, that this would be coming. Um, so it's just so that you're aware of what's happening at the site. OK. Councillor Andrews. Uh, yeah, yes, Chair. I wasn't I wasn't at this meeting when this uh, at, at this meeting we should discuss this. Um, uh, can, can the officers? Um, it's, it's very difficult for me to uh, looking at these plans to work out exactly what the exactly what the officers have done. Can the officers say is it, um, is is the height 
of the new building uh, uh, greater or smaller than the existing building? Um, is it uh, is, is the um, square um, is is the is the is the volume of the building any different? And um, uh, and and where has it been? And 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 where and where has it been moved from? Where to where? Because it's not it's not clear on this plan. Okay, so so there's some sort of um, brief sort of vital statistics. Um, the the existing garage that that you saw there has a ridge height of three point two meters, um, and it's seven point five meters uh, wide along along that eastern boundary, and it's about one point seven meters from the boundary. The the proposed um, uh, garage is higher in height, has a steeper roof pitch. It's 4.3 metres in height, and it's but it's set in 3.7 metres from the boundary. So it's set further into the application site, away from the boundary. But the actual width is still 7.5 metres. Uh, no, I think it's it's um, it's shorter. Sorry, it's about seven meters. I think it's about it's shorter than the existing one. Uh, Further right. into the site, slightly higher roof pitch, but and, and and sharper roof pitch rather than the broader one that the current building has. I think it's 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 it's, it's so it's less dominant. Uh, thank you, Chair. Pardon. So you wouldn't be able to fit accommodation into the roof space then? I th it's quite not easily, no, it's quite a steep pitch. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yes, Councillor Thackeray. Um, just uh, ask for clarification, please. Uh, if the building was proposed to be four, four metres to the ridge, would it require planning permission at all? Uh, just if I can just carry on, I thought uh, 2.5 metres to the eaves and 4 metres to the ridge and cool 50% of your land area. I believe. Well, let's find out. So Ellie's just reminded me that it's because it's in the conservation area, you don't have uh, those six PD rights when it's at the side. Uh, All right, any more questions? No, I have no speakers on this item, so I think we'll go to Councillor Andrews as the local member. Oh, uh, 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 well, ch well, Chair, um, I've, I've looked at this and um, uh, I, I realise it's a sensitive, in a, a sensitive development in a development area, but the, um, the, the, the garage is already there and we're simply seeking to replace it. And I understand from the officers um, that there are no, that there don't seem to be any strong views um, now that the, the, the garage, now the garage has been relocated. Um, so I propose approval. Thank you. Seconded by Councillor. Happy Cleary. to second. Thank you. Anybody else wishing to speak? Uh, well, just a quick one from me because I went on the site visit, and uh, this is one of those where. I'm glad to say that it seems to be sensible compromise between the applicant and the officers to come to a good compromise. Uh, I'm quite uh, because I actually spoke to the applicant and the neighbour who was uh, objecting to it, and he's quite happy with the compromises here. Uh, and I'm quite happy that there are the two the conditions about um, the PD rights for the boundary and so on. So yeah, happy to support that. We've got uh, a mover and a seconder, so we'll go to the vote. That is unanimous. We will move swiftly on to item nine on page 155. And we are back to Neve. Oh, can I just add that that was uh, approval condition on conditional on 
uh, the officers going back and the uh, PD rights. OK, off we go. Thank you, Chair. If we can just go to the map, please. It's just the next slide. Thank you. Um, this application site relates to uh, approximately 20 acres of agricultural land and buildings utilised by Elk Livery, um, which is in close proximity to the residential property of Elk Lodge under the same ownership. This site is located to the northwest of Flaxton, south of Thornton Le Clay, and is accessed via Moor Lane, which is towards the west of the site. Um, the wider blue line land is a 55 acre property and incorporates a number of agricultural fields and buildings. To the south lies the railway line and to the far north and northeast of the wider land under the applicant's ownership are residential properties. At the nearest point, these are over 225 metres away from the red line land. The Elk Livery Partners run both equine and farm activities within the Red Line application site, with further agricultural activities being undertaken on the remaining land. Um, the game stock business commenced on the site in the late 1970s, and there's been a successful farming business run from the site since then. It's noted that Mr Pillow Senior, who established this, bit, this business, um, had to slow down just due to health reasons and farm diversification was sought at that point. And it was at this point where there was an introduction of a livery business to complement the agricultural business. This was around 2019. Um, it was noted that the buildings within the site were used for over 30 years, mostly for rearing chickens, turkeys, geese, pheasants and partridge. But now the farming business is focused around rearing lambs, growing hay and farm contracting. So this application actually seeks approval for the retrospective change of use um, for the red line land to form a mixed use of agricultural and equine livery facility. And that's within the red line land only. This would include uh, retrospective approval for the formation of a 30 of a 39.6 by 39.6 meter arena, a lunch pen, a horse walker, the installation of a storage container for welfare purposes, including the WC and kitchen facilities, the repurposing of existing building to form 10 stables, um, which is the one that's just sort of in the central point there, the larger building, and also the erection of seven double stables. That's four to the north of the site and three to the south of the site. And these were on bases that were formerly associated with the agricultural use. Uh, the livery building holds a maximum of 24 stables available for commercial purposes and the applicants confirmed that the maximum number of horses on site would be 24 within the stables and approximately three on grass. They noted they wouldn't increase the number of horses on grass and to increase the numbers within buildings, they are aware that that would require further planning application, but in their view, they believe this to be unlikely. Um, so yeah, just looking at the map there, you can see the aforementioned residential property to the north, which is approximately 225 metres away from the red line boundary of the site. And I think that's just important to highlight because that is the closest residential property and separate ownership at quite a significant distance. And just moving on to the photographs, the first few will show the entrance onto Moor Lane. And you can see at this point, it's quite a wide entrance, room for two cars to pass. The next photograph is from the same sort of angle looking southwards. And one of the things that's notable is there's very few other accesses onto Moor Lane at this point. The next photograph is actually taken from within the small access lane. And that will take you onto the gates of the site, which are visible in this next photograph. So there's plenty of room for turning and manoeuvring here. Um, I thought it was just interesting to note on this one, this is one of the other agricultural buildings in the background that doesn't form part, part of this application process that will remain agricultural. Um, it's also just a good point of reference for some of the next photographs is on a site as large as this, it can be a little bit difficult to just explain exactly where each photograph is. So this is just perhaps useful. So the next photograph is taken from 
it's actually quite close to the residential property of Elker Lodge, which is just sort of behind the camera. And this shows the access and where vehicles coming into the site will kind of make their way through. The next photograph is looking, sorry, just towards, sorry, I'm making it a little bit hard to make out. Uh, sorry, bear with me just a second. Sorry, can we just go back a couple, please? Um, yep, so the next one, and then the next one, I'll be able to tell you where we are now. So we're now within the site and we're looking sort of west towards the agricultural building that we just looked at before. Um, and in the background of that is Elker Lodge, which is the associated dwelling. So the next photograph is looking back towards that same agricultural building. You're noticing all the landscaping surrounding the site there as well. It's very mature. Um, some of the fields in the foreground are fields that form part of the change of use to the agricultural um, and equestrian purposes. So the next photograph is actually looking towards the arena. Um, and then to the left hand side, you can see the storage building, which was associated with the agricultural business, but now stores hay for the equestrian use. Um, beyond this is the stable building. So this is the largest stable building and it holds 10 stables. And this was, again, associated with the game stock business previously. So that is the conversion of an existing building on the site for stables. Um, the next photograph is just another view, really. So we're looking towards the horse walker, the stable building. You can see that again, the lunch pen and the hay storage building. The next photograph is the lunch pit. And the next one is the arena again. You can see the light into the arena. The next one is the horse walker. The next one is the stable building again from a different angle. So the next one is actually from a much more southerly view towards that group of development. Um, you can see the back of the stable building. And I would just point out the blue storage container, which forms the WC and kitchen facilities just to the right hand side of that. So the next one again is from the south. And I've put this one in because, again, there is an existing agricultural building, not part of the application site. But in future photographs, this will help you just anchor where the development is. So the next one. This is actually towards the southern part of the site, and you can note in the foreground there are the remaining former um, game bird buildings, and these don't actually form part of this application site, but it just gives you a little bit of an understanding of the type of units that were all over this site at one time. Um, members in the late pages that are on your desks have actually got a plan that was put forward by the applicant to indicate the large number of these type of buildings that were all over and where they were formally located. But we'll come back to that um, shortly. So the next photograph is further up this southern side. But at this point, we're looking at the three stables and it's just three at this point that have been erected on the existing concrete bases. And the next one is just another view of that. So the next photograph is from these three units at the south looking northwards. Um, so you're seeing other land that will be used for grazing horses and also lambs. The next one is actually looking down towards the west of the site. And the blue agricultural building I pointed out most recently is just there as well. And you can see the like the kind of made track. And it was along these tracks where access to the former game buildings would have been taken. Um, so again, I would recommend having a look at that plan just to see the extent of what has been there previously. So the next one is looking west towards um, the stable buildings. They're quite difficult to see in this one. It's a little bit small, but there's four there in the background and you can see the trees beyond that. Um, the four to the right hand side are present. One's actually since been removed since I've taken these photographs. Um, 
the next one is actually looking at these more northerly four units that we've referenced. Um, and again, that's taken advantage of one of the former kind of trails that was here for the game bird business. Um, so they're quite sort of standard size, stable buildings, quite similar to the game bird buildings in terms of proportions. But the next photograph is just a better view of that. And the next photograph is just looking again over where the grazing land is. The next one is just that grazing land, but we're looking towards the landscape and to the north of these that you can see in the background of that photograph. And then after that, we're actually at that landscaping. So at this point, we're looking in the field that's under the same ownership of the applicant, but that doesn't form part of the change of use. So this is just purely agricultural. And very far in the distance, the 225 metres away is the separate residential property. So the next photograph is again, just looking further north a little bit more to the eastern side. Um, and the next one is just looking back down towards this track. And on the left hand side is the building that's since been removed uh, since I've taken these photographs. Um, so that is the end of the photographs. If we can just go back to the aerial map. Um, I'd just like to note the applicant has confirmed they offer a range of services. It includes DIY livery, full and part time livery and arena hire. They've confirmed they operate at almost full capacity and generally see around 10 sets of visitors daily to attend to their horses, with many owners keeping multiple animals. It's noted that a family member who's an agricultural contractor brings home hay for bed and as part of his normal journey and feed is delivered once per month, which apparently is much less uh, sort of volumes of traffic than the previous game bird business. Um, the arena can be separately hired by persons not associated with delivery, but the experience to date is that twice a week is a good week for the business. Um, and yeah, as I've already pointed out, the additional plan with the sheds and structures that have since been removed. But I do just want to highlight this is only be 